Yo, First Smoke family, fsotd.com, firstsmokeoftheday.com. We got a brand new website experience. It will be an app soon. Trust me, you'll be able to exist on this all day long. It's a community, fsotd.com. Support the show. Join the family. We really appreciate it. We got new merch hitting the site. Nice stone wash hoodie here. We got ashtrays from the family reunion. If you weren't there and you want to get some memorabilia, you want to support the gang, go ahead and get on there. Make sure you do that. Also, shout out to Dr. Dabber. Big's got the Sean O'Malley, the big switch, the sold out piece. Use code FSOTD, drdabber.com, at Dr. Dabber. Give them a follow. And if you need to use Grow Generation or need to go get any drip, growgeneration.com, over 60 stores nationwide. In person or online, use code First Smoke 10. You're going to get an extra 15% off your already discounted price. We really appreciate you guys supporting the show. And without any further ado, we're about to get into this legendary story. Ellie, Ellie. what you know about the champagne? champagne? What you got, Pelly? Uh, yeah, you got Pelly. Oh, you got Pelly. Oh, what? It's on me? No, no, Ellie and Pelly. Before I knew my nigga Francis was here, I was at the telly. And he came through this motherfucker with a bag of champagne. That's Champelli, so I wish that Pelly come back. Come on, man. Got the legend <laughs> in the building today. Bay Area legend. And if you don't know, now you know. My man Champelli, how you doing? You know, off of the streets, you know, I had a few million dollars in the mid-90s. Mid-90s, I was going hard and, like, taking trips to Humboldt and bringing down, like, four or 500 pounds. One of my friends that I sold weed to, his girlfriend was a lawyer, and she ended up getting into the elevator with me. And she told me, if you can leave the country right now, now and pack it up, like basically leave. Yo, what's up, everybody? We're back, man. It's first smoke of the day. It's your boy Packer in the building. Here with my man Black Leaf as always. What's good, Biggs? Smoking some Pelly. Come on, man. We got the <laughs> legend in the building today. Bay Area legend. And if you don't know, now you know. My man Champelli, how you doing? Man, it's just a blessing to be here with you guys today. Super big 85th episode. First smoke of the day. You guys have been holding it down, doing it for the culture here, man. It's a it's an honor to be on the show finally. You know what I mean? We finally made it happen and uh it's going to be a good one, man. I definitely, I'm, I'm just, you know, super stoked. I appreciate you guys for everything you're doing, man, for sure. Your story is, you know, I don't know enough ab about it yet. I wanted to stay a little bit naive, but mm -hmm. from what I do know, it's, I got a, I got a lot of questions for sure. It's like, <laughs> it's remarkable. Like, it, you know, if, if for you guys at home, just Google Champelli and quick little history lesson and stuff and, and do your research. But my man's a Bay Area legend been putting it down for a long time and we were just talking about it before on the off the mic how you were the first if not one of the first that was putting your name on bags branding bags and like putting yourself out there is like yeah that's me yeah you know i mean back then it's like before there was even you know cell phone i mean before there was even cell phones you know there was like even forms of just marketing and branding and stuff like that even before names on bags it's like it's interesting how it's you know people how how that sort of thing was built into the culture and just naturally even without you know cell phones or mylars or anything like that how people used to hustle and and move and you know do their own form of branding and everything back in the day you know so it was still going on it's just evolved now essentially you know it's pretty dope it's crazy to me and you know just starting out in the beginning kind of like where where's champelli growing up at where you where you yeah. from where you reigning from so, you know, to go all the way back, I was actually born in Spain, in southern Spain, and uh, and my parents lived over there, and basically my mom, uh, they separated, and my mom came to San Francisco, and my dad ended up staying in Spain. So, like, when I was, like, a year and a half, two years old, I moved to San Francisco. We ended up moving to the Tenderloin, which is, like, if you know San Francisco, you know the Tenderloin is like one of the roughest neighborhoods kind of, or one of the roughest neighborhoods in San Francisco, you know, it's like pretty, pretty downtrodden sort of downtown area of the city, you know, um, and that's kind of where we ended up. Um, and then from there, I basically, we moved to the Mission District. So that's kind of like where I ended up kind of growing up 
most of my life was in the mission district and I would go back and forth uh, to Spain to visit my dad a bit too every now and then, you know, so, but yeah, mostly San Francisco. That's crazy. Cause yeah. I mean, that's total different sides. Yeah. Like, yeah, two different worlds too. Like, honestly, like, you know, going back, I mean, already going to Spain back then was like, you were stepping back in time, like 20 years from the United States or 30 years. Like, you know, it's like, you know, people were on donkeys and horses and shit damn near. Like, you know, it was like at that point where it was not as many roads. Like it was like, it was, it was a different world, honestly, a different time. And to watch the world has just changed super dramatically in the last 30 years, you know, 40, I mean, years, it's just been like dramatic change, you know what I mean? So it's, it's, it's interesting, but some actually just to touch on it, some of my first like memories and stuff of like weed actually comes from uh, just bringing it up real quick, just interjecting that I remember my dad used to have plants out on his like balcony, you know, he was an artist, a painter, and he'd have like a little balcony with some just, and he would just be like smoking the leaves. I would never really see too much like big flower or anything. It was just some, you know, you'd just be rolling up some leaf basically at that point, you know, not tripping, just happy to try to get high on some leaf. Yeah. That's a very Spain thing. Plants yeah. on the balcony. Yeah. Plants. It is. Yeah. You go over there and it'll be plants on the balcony. And sh yeah. It's the, I can see now why you, you got the multicultural approach of like someone that's been well-traveled and well-rounded and like understands different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. I always was like curious about that. So that makes total sense to like, you come from there and then you're getting brought to San Francisco, which is like another melting pot of like mm -hmm. big city. And yeah, it was almost like the immigrant experience in a way, you know what I mean? Uh, full on because it's like, uh, you know, my dad had moved to Spain just to kind of like av avoid the draft for one of my brothers and they'd moved over there and he was an artist and was just always kind of like it been not a hippie, but more like a beatnik artist type. And always like before that they lived in Mexico and then, you know, came back to the United States for just a very little time and then moved to Spain. So it's kind of like always been kind of all over the place, but I've been, you know, blessed to have that kind of international outlook and have be exposed to different cultures and different stuff like that. And it really does make a difference, you know, like growing up as a kid to be exposed to like different cultures and different peoples and ways of life. And it expands your, you know, your, your horizon, so to speak mentally and your, you know, the way you perceive stuff and everything is definitely a blessing. I'm definitely thankful that I got to experience that, you know, for sure. Expands your palate, you know, yeah. for not just food, but like interests, mm -hmm. branding, like, Oh, that shirt's different. I don't see that in the U S. Oh, that's, you know, it's like everything layers of, like you're exposed to more. So you, you feel more, you touch more, you see more, you taste mm -hmm. more, you know, like it makes a difference. It, it's like even kids that grow up um, speaking more than one language, they're at an advantage in life for sure. Cause they understand yeah. people at a much higher level yeah. than just someone that only has seen one side. Yeah. So that, that let that be a lesson. Anybody who's got, you know, has like a family that speaks more than one, you know, language in the household, like try to teach your kids, you know, to make sure to teach them that other language, you know, it's going to give them, it's another tool in life for sure. Or even if you don't have any other languages in the house while the child is young, that's the time to expose them to all, any, whatever language you basically want them to learn, you know? And uh, so that's pretty dope, man. It's like, actually when I was living in Europe as a kid and traveling a little bit, you know, going back and forth, I was like, spent some time in Amsterdam also. So I was actually playing with the kids there and like, remember like speaking, my mom said I was like speaking Dutch and shit, basically. Yeah. So like when I go to Amsterdam and I hear like Dutch, like it like triggers this weird thing. I can't speak it, but it was just like, my brain's like, you know, like I was like, eh, eh, what is something like it's something's going on there, you know? But yeah, no, it's definitely, that's the time to teach your kids. You know what I mean? The language, you know, for sure. When you're growing up like that at the time, like looking back, it feels like a blessing, but did it at the time that much traveling as a kid, were you like, oh, this is awesome. Or were you like, wow, this is hectic. Yeah. You know, as a, as a kid, you don't really, you're not really tripping or thinking about it too much. You know what I mean? And I was like young enough that I didn't really, wasn't like fully subjected to like my parents splitting up or I didn't really like, didn't have to like go through at least remember going through like any of the breakup or anything of that. So it wasn't like 
that side of it wasn't like hectic but i mean it was there was times i'd travel to fly to go see my dad and they would put me on the plane by myself and i'd be riding like with the stewardesses all the time they'd like hold me down i go hang out with the captain and shit I remember that as a kid, like back in the day when you could like go actually up there while they're flying the plane as a kid and, shit, and like, you know, so it was, it was dope, you know, for sure. If you're young and get to travel like that, they definitely show love. Yeah, on the plane. yeah, like exactly. The staff's always cool as hell with kids. Like, yeah. they know you're there without a parent. And, yeah, you know. I remember like being a stopover, like flying to Europe and it's like I stopped over in New York and I got to hang out with like all the all the um stewardesses and stuff and like got off the plane it's like i was just like hanging in the back with like them and eating their food and shit and it's like <laughs> you know that wouldn't happen nowadays mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. much but uh yeah back then it was like that was pretty dope back then they actually used to smoke on airplanes too so you would be on a 15 hour plane ride and fools were just blowing down just regular cigarettes the whole time in a plane which was fucked up it was like oh and that that, that lasted into the like 90s i think it was like crazy oh, for sure there's Smoking still on some of those old planes you still see the little ashtrays, ashtrays. The, yeah yeah that's when you I know i could imagine that Smoking so cigarettes. I mean, no, it was fucked. There are people smoking weed on planes right now. If they still allowed that, oh, yeah. you know, people would be like, a little hash inside the. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. People just always got to take it to the next level right now. Like, of course, yeah. right? <laughs> so, tenderloin and then to Mission. Mission is yeah. also a rough area, right? Mission District is an interesting area in San Francisco. Mission District is surrounded by like. I was in specifically in Bernal Heights, which is like a hill, right, right, basically in the mission. And it's surrounded by, you got what was called then Army Street Projects, Highland Street Projects, Alamany Street Projects, Third Street Projects, Sunnydale. Like you have like so many different things, like kind of like major hoods and turfs that were like basically all projects in San Francisco that kind of like surround basically the mission and Bernal Heights specifically that area, you know? So yeah, it was a, uh, you know, it was interesting. I went to all public schools basically, you know, and, um, you know, my mom just, she cleaned houses for a living and, you know, we were just very humble beginnings as far as that goes. And, um, and yeah, being basically public schools there, I was like, I was, you know, almost the only white boy in school practically, you know, and type of thing. And so I grew up very, di very diverse, you know, San Francisco, you know, it was a very diverse city at that time. What's it like going to high school in San Francisco at that time? As you're like getting older and stuff to where you like start making your own opinion and, you know, kind of making your own decisions and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, high school was, you know, I mean, it was dope. It, it was very eclectic bunch. Lots of, at that time, it was like a lot of stoners, obviously all kind of like cutting and hanging out on the back steps and like, you know, not, I mean, that's like a lot of my high school. I was like cutting class and smoking weed, honestly, which was because I was like, oh, fuck that class. You know what I mean? I already, I'm not trying to, this, this, the teacher's a dick or it's moving too slow. And I mean, I was like relatively smart kid and I'd be like, man, this shit's bullshit. I could go spend better time, you know, whatever, doing something else. But, you know, that's not my advice to anybody or any kid by any means, you know, stay in school and stick to your shit. But, uh, but I was definitely like, you know, cutting class and you know smoking weed and hanging out there used to be actually i went to mcateer school uh, uh it was called now school of the arts and it was like next to this canyon in san francisco called glen park canyon so it was like a big ass canyon down below where you could go and like hide out and smoke weed basically so it was actually pretty clutch Later on, I ended up growing some plants in there, like gorilla style, <laughs> like <laughs> after I'd left the high school, which is crazy too. Yeah. That's fucking amazing. You use yeah. the landscape to your advantage. We come from Florida. We never got no yeah. advantage like that. Like, is that fucking Lance right there? Yeah, oh, from uh, two miles away, you're like, is you that a see. plant over there? Yeah, yeah, yeah the yeah, guy, dang. is he watering that? <laughs> yeah, there's no hiding out. No, not at all. Yeah. Um, what, what was your first time smoking weed? What led you to the weed scene? I mean, scene? you know, so what really, I think it it really was, you know, you know, it comes from just family a lot of the time is kind of where you pick a lot of that sort of stuff up, you know. So it goes back to my my uh, brother actually had a, a coffee shop in Amsterdam like in the late 70s, basically, you know. So I kind of got exposed to got exposed to weed almost, I would say through there. Like I remember being in his, uh, his apartment in Amsterdam, rest in peace. He's since passed away, but, it, uh, he, um, 
I opened up like this closet and it was just like all stacked up with like, like Lebanese hash, like big giant, you know, like bales of hash, basically bricks of hash, like big, like 10 kilo bricks of hash basically. And then like they would wrap it in cellophane, you know? So it was just like, and then, so that was like my earliest memories I, I've talked about before, like Bob Marley and like the smell of hash and like seeing that, you know, that's kind of like my earliest memories of music and cannabis was pretty much that I'd say. Damn, that's crazy. Big yeah. bro, like bales of hash yeah. put up, cellophaned up in Amsterdam. In Amsterdam. So, I mean, that was like a major like point for like, as far as smuggling goes, like that's where like a lot of shit would go to Amsterdam back in the day and then disperse into the rest of Europe and stuff. And then there was like coffee shops and like just, you know, trade going on in Amsterdam at that time. You know what I mean? Later on, I found out, I talked to my brother and it was like, actually they'd brought uh 400 kilos of hash from lebanon in like a vw bus <laughs> yeah wow. so that's what that was like part of that load <laughs> it was like 400 kilos of hash from lebanon in a vw bus you know wow that's like back in the day when you'd have they'd have to have a dog to catch you now they got like radar and oh yeah yeah exactly yeah. and that's at border crazy. checkpoints and, and in yeah. the vw yeah yeah, yeah, yeah exactly that's fucking classic yeah that is classic where's yeah. your brother born like where, what was his like how far apart are you guys so like, we're like big there's like between my brother who was doing all that and kind of had ties to the weed world and stuff there was like probably like 17 year difference i think almost between us you know i was kind of like the youngest of uh youngest of five brothers so yeah so, wow yeah yeah so i was like totally like they grew up in a whole other time a whole other like world essentially and then then i came along basically you know it's the last afterthought so to speak you know major version of it yeah yeah exactly yeah so what, your first time smoking that's in it's in the bay so my first time smoking sorry i'd gotten off track there but my first time smoking was actually in elementary school uh my my brother was one of my other brothers was actually growing plants in my mom's kitchen pantry in san francisco in bernal heights so there's like a little kitchen pan like a little pantry off from the kitchen where there was like plants and dishes and the cat litter box and shit like that, you know, and it had like some cupboards and then had, you know, a skylight. So that's where I was like, he was growing there and I ended up like scraping together some leaves and taking it to school. And we like try to roll it up in binder paper in like elementary school, me and the homie. So, you know, what I, mean? I don't know how I came up with that or what, but I mean, it must've been just, you know, watching them or other people or somebody talking about it at school. I was like, Oh, I got some of that at home or whatever it was, you know? So I ended up bringing some weed to school and then we tried smoking. And then ironically later on was my brother, you know, wasn't staying there with us. Um, that was like the same space that I ended up growing in for my first time it was in that same little spot right there, actually. Wow. So, yeah. you, so you basically saw all these plays like played out. And so it yeah. just seemed like that's what you were supposed to do almost like. I mean, yeah. I mean, in a, a way idea. it's a trip. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. I mean, I even before I was smoking or growing or anything, my brother like took me to uh, Mendocino on the coast of Mendocino. One of his uh, good friends, one of our good family friends at this point was growing up there, like, you know, very guerrilla style at that time. And um, it was like, shit was just yeah like weed was everywhere basically you know what i mean i drove up there with my brother they had something going on whatever it was but that was kind of like another you know seeing like a farm and seeing shit growing outdoors and stuff like that you know and what year was this shit this was in the 80s basically Probably so yeah. that must have been like the mid 80s that i saw all that you know what i mean mid 80s because later on like when i first started growing was basically like in uh, what would I say? Like probably 87, 88 is like when I first grew so my first born. weed. Yeah. Fuck. Yeah. yeah. That's okay. <laughs> Holy shit. Yeah. That's I How was, old were you? So, I mean, I started, I mean, I have to do the math. I'm horrible at dates, but I basically was like 11, 12 years old, 12 years old for sure. I was like already selling weed and smoking it and everything. So it's like, 
Yeah. Youngest of five brothers, that shit's gonna that's gonna happen. Whenever people <laughs> yeah, tell yeah, me they exactly. were super young, I'm like, you must have older siblings. Yeah, yeah, shit. exactly. So that there you go. Let that be a warning to the parents out <laughs> yeah. there. Because you know, Bro, you grow up around the reality of your surroundings, you know what I mean? I'm blessed that it was just cannabis mm -hmm. and everything. Um, you know, because I mean, ultimately, like in the neighborhoods that I grew up with in San Francisco at that time in the eighties, like, I mean, I grew up around a lot of other crazy shit, but luckily I stuck to weed. You know what I mean? It was like the crack era shit was just going off everywhere. And it was like, it was, you know, it was, it was pretty crazy in a lot of inner cities in the United States in the, in the late eighties, you know, I feel like of what I've been told is like when crack hit, like the people that used it, they didn't know like the, 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 you know, they didn't know like the effects. They didn't know like, uh, yeah. like, like how oh, bad it was or how yeah. bad it was going to be or how bad it could get yeah. just by trying it. Yeah. So People I just got hooked. Yeah. So I was in middle school, you know, when I was in middle school, I had a friend of mine actually that, you know, um, he was from uh, Hunter's point, but yeah, he would come to school and he'd bring little vials to school. You know, and he'd have his little vials and he'd be like getting them off if he could at school, in middle school or get them off outside of middle school, or whatever. But he'd always come with huge wads of cash. This is in like 88. He would have huge wads of cash and um, and be doing it, you know, like wow. at that time. And he'd always be like, yo, you want some you want you want to try one? Like he'd ask me if I wanted to try it. Like here, you have a free one. Like the first one was always free type of shit, you know. Yeah. So I was like, brother. here, he was like, here, you want to <laughs> yeah. try this or whatever. And uh, it's funny because it's somebody that I actually had fought with. We'd actually scrapped back then, and we kind of he like respected me because I like held my ground and shit at that time. And then, uh, but I was always like, nah, I'm cool, you know. I just knew without knowing, but I kind of knew like, no, nah, I'm not, you know, I'm not fucking with the little, the little vials, you know? So, but, um, but we'd go to the corner store there, like after school or before school. And you'd always have like a huge ass wad of cash. And he'd like break me off. Like if some, a few dollars, like here, go buy, you know, buy some candy basically. So I'd like buy some shit, you know? Or but, um, yeah, it's interesting. The whole crack thing was like, you know, it was pretty devastating to the communities and watching, you know, what it did. Um, and like you say, people didn't know really what it, what, what it really was or what it was going to do. You know, nobody had yeah. that foresight, you know, going from just regular Coke to crack is, is a huge difference, you know. And you're in the heart of it in San Francisco because it's like big city, a lot going on and like. I mean, you go, you walk 10 blocks, you see everything. Yeah. Like, I mean, every shop, every type of, so you, are you basically exploring as a kid? Like you guys, I mean, yeah, about, I was like, like you, yeah, you, I was you, wild you know. as a kid. Like I used to skate, you know? So I was like, as a skater, you're always exploring, you know? And then I also used to do graffiti. So as a graffiti artist and a skater, like part of that is just exploring and going, you know, going all over the place. So we would skate everywhere and be doing graffiti you know, so I was all over the place, but yeah, the, you know, the, uh, the inner city, like all the projects were the places that got hit hardest with the crack. You know what I mean? That was like, where it was like, oh, and that's like basically what I was surrounded with was all that, you know, it was pretty much, um, all the, like the major projects and stuff. And they were like affected the worst by, you know, obviously, um, crack and stuff at that time, you know, uh, which is like, it's no conspiracy as we know now, basically, or, you know, whatever it could be debated, but it's, it's odd that they were the ones that were, you know, obviously affected, you know? Yeah. And you don't hear about stories of like 12 year olds in middle school offering kids crack. Yeah. Yeah. Like you exactly. don't feel like that would be happening nowadays. Like probably yeah, not. You know yeah. What I, mean? but I don't it's like know. The fact, I mean, this was like, yeah, maybe, maybe not know. crack now, yeah. maybe something else. Yeah. Cause it's sure. changed, you know, like now it would be, you know, fentanyl, fentanyl or, some shit, or yeah. pills or some yeah. other shit. But at that time, like we had actually had, we had like a little gathering in the morning, me and the homies before we'd go to class and we'd all like bring something from home, like to get high off of like, so this was like in sixth grade, we'd all show up and like meet behind the library. Like there was like another library down the street and like, it'd be like, oh, I brought a bottle of wine. One guy would be like, oh, I brought a pistol. Oh, I brought like some weed that I stole from my dad. Or I brought some acid or like whatever. And like, we'd all like, I remember one time this guy brought a, a duster. It was like an angel dust with weed. 
And like we ended up, uh, we didn't know, I didn't know what it was going to do to me. So we ended up smoking that and like floating to class, like sixth grade. <laughs> like I was like, just kind of floating my way to class. Just didn't know what to expect. I didn't know, you know, I mean, he, I don't think he even really knew. So, but yeah, shit was, shit was different back then for sure. And then, um, yeah, he was, uh, that, that same guy was like selling acid in, in, uh, middle school, like in sixth grade too. So people were dropping acid and shit in my middle school. Crack was around, acid, weed, you know, the whole whole thing. It was like, uh, and this is middle school in the Mission District. Yeah. No, I feel like, I feel like it's not like, like if you come from a small town, yeah. that not shit, gonna, like you just won't even yeah, know Yeah, you won't even that know shit. that. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Coming Thank from goodness, a big so city, it's like, it's like holy yeah, yeah, shit. Yeah, exposure. Of, yeah. You know, and you're like, what, what, 12, 13 in this time? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, like 12, you know, basically, yeah. So when does it cross up into like when you start getting you go through high school, you're in the bay and stuff like when you start like getting involved in like music and like, yeah. you know, kind of just meeting, meeting some people and like deciding that like, hey, this maybe maybe I can maybe this is you know, this is what I want to do. You know, I always loved like music was always kind of like one of my first passions, you know, when I was like, um, I also used to break dance as well so i'm kind of like <laughs> skating break dancing graffiti like all the pillars of like you know as far as the urban and um you know lifestyle in a sense um so that's kind of like part of one of my reasons i got exposed to music early on and then um uh, my brother always had like a crazy record collection and stuff like that um, just like hella UK reggae, like albums that were like, you'd never really seen the United States. And my mom was into music too, and had like a dope record collection. So I'd always be like scratching on her record player. And then I used to make mixtapes on, um, off of this local, like radio station in San Francisco, basically. So I'd get, you know, two tapes and cue them up and like be doing like the Roxanne Shantae battles and like different, like old school hip hop stuff, you know, like real, real old school stuff. And, um, it was dope. It was dope. It was a dope time. You know, that was like when video games like first started emerging. So like down the street, there was like on mission street, there was a spot where you could go and play, you know, Pac-Man or, you know, or whatever, when it first came out and shit. So it was like really some eighties, 1980s <laughs> shit, you know, real arcade days. Yeah. Yeah. yeah real arcade That's days. Dope as hell, actually. Yeah. It was pretty dope. It was a dope, well, you, was you, unique you, time. Honestly, you grew up in a hell of a time. It was honestly, like, there's nothing like it. You grew yeah. up in the perfect time. Yeah, it was really, Bay, like, it was, it was, you know, it was a definitely interesting time. So I got like, yeah, being there, I got exposed and was interested in so many different things. Like, I was saying from skateboarding, graffiti, break dancing. Um, I mean, hip hop, obviously, you know, involved in that was like my first involvement with the music. I mean, even then there was like a lot of punk shows at this place called the farm that was down on patrol uh, street where it was like all these like legendary punk shows back in the day, bad brains and gang green and MDC and DRI and like all these guys. And I used to like sneak over there. Like it was like, I was super young, would go like watch shows and shit. And, um, but so I think that's where like my interest for music kind of stems is like that, you know, it's like just being, being kind of, uh, you know, just the culture I was around and stuff exposed to all this music. So that was kind of like how I, how I started, uh, you know, kind of getting my initial exposure. And then later on I had a friend rest in peace, Aris, uh, Volkus, aka Syra, really dope, dope brother of mine that uh, later on passed away, but a super dope graffiti writer and break dancer and, and uh, you know, just just overall dope dude, just dope artist, you know. But um, but he used to have like an ASR ten and a record collection over at his uh his pops uh, warehouse. His dad had like this warehouse that would like all the kids used to go over hang and skate and just do art and just do like what well, you could basically do whatever you wanted over there so we'd just be like smoking you know smoking and, and fucking around with music and painting everywhere and just going crazy as kids you know so it was kind of dope that's yeah really it was this cool. big uh, yeah that's extremely dope yeah it was, it was pretty dope what type of music uh was your was your pops into so artist? my dad yeah my dad like mostly and yeah he would always listen to like mostly like most of his stuff when he was doing his art and stuff was like classical, you know what I mean? Like a lot of classical music or flamenco music or like, so I was like exposed to like, all this. he'd listen to some like American stuff too, you know, Pink Floyd or, you know, different, different shit as well, you know, different things. But, but most of it, his like real 
what he really loved, I think, was classical. It was like mostly his shit, pretty much, you know. It's Which like, is great music to be hearing yeah, when you're a kid. Yeah, you know? yeah, exactly. Right. Uh, yeah. I, I see like it's it's making sense like all your different creative visions and you know, just just meeting you and knowing you and like talking to you, like how your mind works and like I can just tell like you're a free thinker. Mm -hmm. And that definitely has to come from the parents, in my opinion. Like it's instilled in the kids, you yeah, know. Yeah, for sure. To like, hey, you make up your own mind, you you know, yeah. you decide what you like. And I just like that way of like that way of parenting to me is like the best way for for yeah. a kid because it just shows true support. For sure, for sure. You know? Yeah, no, I was definitely, you know, very, very free in that way, you know, kind of just, uh, yeah, no, it makes it, it makes a difference for sure, you know, and, and, and your kids upbringing for sure, you know, having them, giving them that amount of freedom, you know, kids do need some structure, but, uh, but ultimately, yeah, cause it's like my dad, he, he, he kind of decided to like get out of the American kind of lifestyle, you know, he was originally there from, uh, lived in Long Beach and they were just like, Basically, my dad was like had like corporate kind of job at that time and was just trying to fit into the, Society. you know, the American dream at the time of the 50s and 60s or whatever time that was and just decided to drop out of that and like move to Mexico and take his whole family. So they went down and moved to Mexico and took his whole family to just like be an artist in Mexico, which was like rough back then because you couldn't really make no money back then as an artist, American artist in Mexico, really, you know. It's like everybody was already doing hella bad around you, you know, nobody's really got bread to buy art. So they went through like my brothers and my dad and my pops when they were living down there went through like, you know, they were living in poverty basically, you know, but, uh, but you know, so uh, still interesting, interesting. It's different times. Yeah. Different times. Different yeah. Times. Yeah. Well, for I mean, sure. We could imagine. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was a whole for nother real. world. Like, that's not, I mean, it already sounds like a hell of an adventure for a life for <laughs> yeah, a kid, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, when you, when you're getting older now, cause yeah. I know we're talking 12, 13, we're like 15, 16, 17, like 18 now, and you're getting older, like what, what's yeah. going through your mind? Like, are you thinking like, definitely don't want to do school, definitely don't want to do a job or like, yeah. you know, what's, what do you. Yeah. I mean, I pretty much, you know, I was already hustling from an early age of like 12 years old. I was already like trying to like flip sacks and shit and, you know, try to just basically keep up with my own little weed habit that I had going essentially is kind of how it begins. And you're like, Oh, I can make a little money doing this, you know? So I was kind of like, you know, selling weed and growing weed like super early on, you know? Um, I was like, ended up some of the first weed I grew I was like basically light depping it in like 80 set or like 88. I'd say I was like doing light dep. I was like taking my plants out of my mom's pantry and bringing them into the basement at six o'clock every day and then bringing them back up the next day. So, cause my, uh, my old school family kind of hippie friend had told me, you know, if you kind of do like a deprivative of light, it's going to flower sooner. And I was already impatient, like putting leaves and shit in the oven, trying to get high, like smoking shit out of the pantry, oregano, whatever, you know what I mean? Just like, so, so as soon as I heard I could like, you know, finish sooner, I was like, oh, that's great. So I was like light depping in 88, basically before, like, that's wow. like, you know, years and years before anybody <laughs> even started, it's like mid two thousands, maybe people started like really fucking with light depping, you know what I mean? And your mom was like, Oh, that's just Champelli. So no, nah, she wasn't having it. She was yeah. like, kind of, yeah, she was on my case about like, at first I was like, all right, this is cute. He's got some plants going out there. And then I started expanding and taking over like the pantry and lining up more plants and all the shit. And then I was like selling that weed at that time. And like naming it and kind of like basically branding it and selling it for like 400 an ounce back then in like 65, 70 and eight. This is in like 88, which is crazy. Man, that boy Pelly guy started for a lot of y'all even were born. <laughs> Holy that's shit. What's, that's that's what's a, I mean, I was just, yeah. that's crazy, bro. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a trip. Man. That's crazy. Um, so, so yeah, you said mom was on your case a little bit. Or yeah, like so mom was on my case. So this is like around high school. Like I was a, a, a junior, basically, or junior. What is it? A freshman, sophomore, junior, yeah, sophomore, basically, uh, in high school. Yeah, and she was on my case because I was like selling out of the house, tons of mushrooms. I used to sell a ton of mushrooms also back in the day. So like shrooms and weed, basically, and then. Um, yeah, so she was sweating me because I was like, people were coming by. I was all out at all hours and she just wasn't having it. 
And then, so at that point I was like 17 and I ended up finding my own apartment and moving out when I was 17 years old and starting my first indoor grow. When I was 17, I ended up moving in with my best friend to this little apartment down basically in the hood down by Valencia projects on uh 14th and uh, close to 14th and mission in this little alleyway called Woodward street. It was like the only place that I would rent to a 17 year old, basically, <laughs> you know what I mean? So, so I ended up getting this little apartment and setting up some ballasts, some thousand waters and like going for it. And actually before that I did have like a phototron, which was like this little booth that they had with lights that they used to advertise in high times. And it like had a couple of little, like fluorescence in it and you could put a plant in it, you know? And so I tried one of those and it like didn't go over super well, but my, my grow at this little apartment in 1991, like, like went over pretty well. And I made like my first 10 G's like in 91, like growing, uh, growing at 17 years old. What were you growing at that time? So I was growing this stuff called the, well, a few different things. One of them was called the Tex, though. It was called the Tex, T-E-X. And it was like this weed that I used to get from my buddy that was always full of seeds. Like literally anytime you get it, it was chock full of seeds. Like, I mean, littered with seeds and it was like brownish red and super spindly. Like you look at it now and probably laugh, but it like smoked the best. Like it was like just the tastiest, tastiest weed, the Tex. And dude sold it for 1600 a QP five g's a pound if you could get a hold of it and this is back then so the tex and he'd always be like bring the seeds back i need the seeds back he didn't want the seeds to get out there back then and he would give you some more weed for like the weight in seeds that you would bring back you know so i would like i ended up just keeping most of the seeds and that's what i like ended up growing was the tex indoors and this stuff was actually supposedly from texas um wow. and it would just look like some crazy like just weird weed. I used to make keef off of it. I had my silk screen back in, you know, 90, 91. And I used to keef some of these things. And it would just be like red, red crystal, red THC keef. It would like be like reddish. It was a trip. That's interesting. Yeah. Wow. And it would just smoke so far. Like you went, and then it would just like, yeah, dripping with red, like a little r resin and just super tasty, like whole different flavor. You know, there was so many, like I say like, I always say there's like back then there was so much diversity and like different strains still I would I was seeing back then like you know like all the original skunks and like all this original Afghan stuff and like different stuff back then that just like as I watched time go on slowly disappeared like what happened to that one strain I didn't see that one strain anymore like where did it go and like and then people didn't have the foresight to like try to make seeds or like keep it around and plus it was like highly illegal not everybody was growing indoor back then it was like super sketchy you know so it was like back then like it would be even sketchy to like drop off some photos to a photo mat with like pictures of weed like there's like risk of them like calling the cops on you type of shit you know which was crazy so i like back then i was always like super secretive you know back then just no no photos barely you know just like super low-key totally different well, times yeah yeah, yeah. I mean, you're going so far back that I'm like trying to, yeah, like, yeah, I just can't even comprehend. imagine the time period because I was like an infant, like, yeah. you know, that's it's just it's crazy. True, it's, yeah. So 17, you hop off the porch, you got your spot bumping and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Would, did, were you naming the text something else and calling it something else? Or so were you no, just the like, text, yo, this I is the kept, text? Yeah, no, the text, I kept it going. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, ultimately, like you kind of want to keep you know, right now it's all, it's the rename game, but stuff, this is like a lot of the reason why stuff gets lost and stuff. Like I'll see some Jack now, but people are calling it Durban poison. It's not Durban poison. Like Durban poison was a whole other thing, whole nother thing where it's like not Jack. So I'm just, just using that as an example of how like the renaming things and changing names, and everything ultimately, you know, is a lot of the reason why stuff starts to get lost and you don't know, you'd be like, Oh, this tastes familiar. It looks like that, but it's, you know, got a new name and it's kind of inevitable now, obviously for the times we're in, but back then you kind of, you know, we just, I wasn't, wasn't really tripping what anybody was thinking. So you just keep the original names. And if I didn't have a name for a seed that I grew, I would like come up with the new name. So like some of the stuff that I grew at my mom's spot, just for example, one of them was called the, uh, I named it the ant juice because it like got like ants stuck in the crystals. Like it was like these little red ants ended up getting stuck in the crystals. And so I called it the ant juice. <laughs> and like everybody, these one, like 
big dealers in the neighborhood that used to just move like tons of pretendo and tons of Mexican weed and just other, just other kind of other weed from South America. Like they would like want to buy all, all my weed all the time, just because it was like, they all had, they had tons of other like bammer and sometimes some good batches of pretendo, but they wanted like that fire. So they were like, they had no problem spending the 400, but they're like, yo, we need the ant juice. Where's the ant juice? So it turned into kind of the legend of the ant juice at that time. Was like people wanting the ant juice, like, like they didn't care that there was ants in there, like, you know, sparking as you're like smoking it. It gave it a little spice or whatever, but it was like super, it was some fire and some different shit for sure. The fucking ant man. That could have been that could up your handle right yeah, there. Yeah, 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 right. The There's ant man. Yo, hit up the ant man. Dude, the That's ant juice. juice. Yeah. It's crazy. They it's must a, have loved the terpenes. Yeah. yeah. So I, fire terps. I, I felt like weed was a lot stickier back then. What do you think so, about that? So, yeah. So that's what I've noticed also is like back then weed used to like cloud up a Ziploc bag. Like you literally would not be able to see through a Ziploc bag and you could literally like scrape the Ziploc bag and get like a layer of crystal off of it. And not only that, like the smells. So it was like Chris, the amount of crystal, the amount of expansion and the amount of smell that would come off like down the block from this weed is like missing in today's weed you know most of it there's a few exceptions right. barely that have some of those qualities but back in the day like shit was like was when you had that. like the indo or you had like some purple skunk or something like that people are going to know about it like down the block type of shit that shit and it was just like coated like the amount of crystal on stuff was just like absurd but it was like not like the type of weed now where it's like you know, high crystal count, but no flavor, no smell. It was like crystal count and flavor and smell. And it was like, weed back then was like the full package. Like it had all the complexities in the back end. Now stuff, certain stuff, not everything I'm saying, but a lot of stuff now is just empty. It looks great, but there's no, there's no nothing to it. Hollow. You know? Yeah. It's the styro, it's like the styro those, weed, styrofoam, you know? <laughs> it's like one of those big Easter egg bunnies. It looks yeah. like a big piece of chocolate. And then it's you just get in the, yeah, you get in there and, and you're like, out. it's just, it's not my air. Basically pretty much. <laughs> what you know? do you think happened? I mean, so part of that is just over time stuff starts to, a lot of these crazy genetics got lost and weren't, you know, weren't continued on you know there was not like heirloom heirloom seeds or anything like that so it's like stuff got lost and stuff started to just people had to cross what was around which was just a weaker a weaker gene pool essentially of genetics and uh in base off uh, and base everything kind of off of like just a handful of things almost everything nowadays is based off of you know, very few things, honestly. And it's just like a smoothie. So a lot of stuff starts to kind of get lost, you know, like real flavors that stand out where it's like you smoke a haze, you know, that's a haze, like that's standing through. That's like a land race that stands on its own. Like there's really like four or five things that kind of like make up everything. You have a Kush, that heavy, heavy indica that when I first smoked the Kush in like the mid nineties, uh, I was like, oh, this hails back and reminds me a little bit of like the original skunks and, and Afghans that I used to get uh, back in the day because it really has that pure, pure skunk, you know, and indica sort of thing, you know what I mean? And that was kind of like, it went kind of missing actually for a minute. Like I was like, damn, what happened? Even in the 90s, it was like, like from the 80s to like the early 90s, like stuff started disappearing and you'd be like, damn, remember that fucking, you know, whatever it was, you'd be like trying to find it and you couldn't find it anymore. So it was like a lot of it is just like stuff getting watered down and just monocrop now and just using a lot of the same stuff. So that's kind of like a little bit of why stuff got diluted basically is my, my theory. And just watching it happen over the years, like this is like what I actually watched with my own eyes slowly just slowly you know kind of go downhill and the amount of diversity back then and flavors were just like crazy and, and potency and shit it was like pretty wild it happened to the dutch too though because a lot of those seeds came from the dutch you mm -hmm. know and it's like even then now if you try to reach back out and you're like man i want the original white widow or the original super lemon haze or the original it's not I feel like the they one hung that on to it a little better than, than we hung on to some of kind of six years it's not going to be what you, you can remember the amnesia the big Buddha, but it's like we say, it's the weed's still different, right? Like it is. They, it's not. They the kind of had more. They kind of had more years in the seed game, mm -hmm. and actually, 
like breeding seeds for sale and keeping it around like that. You know, it was more like it was a little more out there before it was over here, obviously. You know what I mean? It was still very more clandestine and underground over here. But a lot, truth be told, a lot of Dutch stuff was coming from the United States also. Not all of it. there Because, you know, uh, Holland uh, was just such an intersection of cultures. They had stuff coming from Indonesia. They had stuff coming from Thailand, Suriname. Like, you know, they have like all these, a lot of different influences coming from everywhere. So it was like weed was coming from everywhere back then. But like, you know, a lot of the fire stuff, they ended up like when the skunks and stuff, certain stuff was like hitting over here. They like... I remember because I saw it happening. They were bringing a lot of having to come and grab stuff from, from over here and bring it over there. Cause it's like, I took a trip in the kind of early nineties to Amsterdam, me and my best friend, I'd sold a ton of mushrooms was selling weed and took my first trip it was like in 19 over to Amsterdam. Like I'm going to Amsterdam on a mission. Just like we're going over there. It's like, it was Gilders back then. So you could literally double your money going to Amsterdam. And that for like a kid, you're like, dude, doubling your money, weed everywhere, like, you know, red light district or whatever. You're like, OK, yeah. we're going to Amsterdam, you know, um, fire weed, too. Huh? So that was the problem. We got there and we're like, where's the good weed? We looked around. <laughs> we went everywhere. We couldn't find any weed that was better than what we were smoking in San Francisco or in the Bay Area or California at that time. So we were like slightly disappointed. We found some cool things, but we really had to dig through and really, really find some shit. And looking back, there's a lot of cool stuff that I do appreciate about some of those older strains that I remember from back then. There were some cool ones um, that were unique and like different that you don't really see anymore, you know? But it was like, it was tough, honestly. Like, we were like, damn, we came all the way here. They don't even have weed as good as we got back home, you know? And I mean, later on when I went back to Amsterdam too, even in the 2000, early 2000s, I mean, I'd gone there in between then too, but just like remembering back, like, it was tough. Like, we were like, damn, I got to find 2000s. Like, I got to find some OG. Fuck, where's the OG? And so in like 2001, when I had like left the country and went to Amsterdam, I was like looking around just trying to find the good OG. So I was like, man, I just need some real OG, you know? And that's like when the OG was like really pure, super strong and hadn't been like watered down at all or crossed too many times at that point. You know, it was still like a few people just holding on to clones and mothers from the mid 90s still, you know? And that was like, down in LA, Be Real's people, and then up in the Bay and other folks, you know, Josh D's people. And that's kind of like the, that was like that original Kush line that I like, got back in the day, I always had like the Kush too when it was around. But yeah, so, but in 2001, the one thing that I do remember seeing was like the, um, the New York Sour Diesel. And it was like the New York it's sour so much diesel, different than the regular sour so, diesel. So so much different. It's I never like, understood that. It's like <laughs> diesely and gassy and like little weird pods and like, and it was just so fire. So I bought some seeds of that when I I went down to Spain after Amsterdam, and I ended up growing some of it in Spain. But this was in two thousand one. The sour diesel, and like looking back, I saw how the sour diesel actually like spawned like the lemon tree or, you know, lemon diesel originally is what it was, then the lemon tree, then the tangy and all stuff. Like you could see like the qualities within this New York city diesel later on, shout out to Soma and the guys that kind of was like working that line there. But, uh, you know, like you could see where that stuff kind of evolved out of there, which is pretty cool to like see that, you know, which oh, still yeah. goes back and a little bit reminds me of the skunks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It has no, it a does. little bit it of does. that in there. It's like, I think that was the biggest blow to cannabis was losing a lot of the original skunk line. Yeah, yeah. Like, even to this day, I when people are like, what was it like? I'm like, nothing that's out there now. Like, even people bring jars and it's like, it was so different. It was literally the stinker whole house up with an eighth bag weed. The original, you know, yeah. like you can see the lineage from Kush and all these different things. And it's all kind of goes back to like, yeah, skunk was like the originator of a lot of that, especially just everyone had different versions of skunk, but like everyone remembers them like it's yesterday. Like, yo, that shit right there. Yeah. yeah the you skunk know? was really a unique thing. And it literally like was like skunky. And, and that's what like the, um, the closest thing to it alive at this point is the OG essentially, you know, like a real good Kush essentially. And that's kind of like, when you look at Kush, 
that's the OG and the original skunks and Afghans and stuff is like what had that back end and that full kind of like body and that super heavy high that kind of every that Indo that everybody kind of wanted, you know, wanted where it's like the sativa was like a whole nother world, obviously, you know, but you can see where the Kush, you know, obviously is like influenced like every strain right now, any strain that's like fire pretty much right now all has Kush in it essentially. So it's like everything is like leaning on Kush, <laughs> you know, which is goes back to like the closest thing to kind of like an original indica in a way from what I remember, you know. The gas. The gas, you know what I mean? Yeah, the funk, you know. The gas. They want yeah. the gas back, bro. Yeah, and the yeah. skunks, the skunks that I see now, unfortunately, people are like, I got this one. It's, you know, smells like some dead, you know, whatever, you know, uh, some dead carry on or some you know whatever roadkill but it's just not i don't know I, I haven't smelled that smell back out of it yet and i mean even stuff like you know super skunk and, and certain things like that it's just missing like what the original skunk or the skunk one it's still there's i think there's no skunk left in it it's like it's like a shame you know so the closest thing you really could get is like you know i still see it in like certain sours or headbands or obviously ogs and shit like that you'll still see like that closest thing to like what that old quality was like in a way you know so <clears throat> as you're growing and you start to get older and now you got the spot the apartment going right uh when how how much longer before we start to hear about champagne and how before it starts to brand and before you know everything starts to come together yeah so i, I like basically was kind of like you know back then like being the weed man was like a little different than being the weed man now you know it was it's significant. like back then it was like significant like <laughs> you know you had the weed like not yeah not everybody is gone yeah not everybody you know had weed back then so when you had weed it was like a special thing you fired up at a concert like everybody's like yo come rushing over you go like you know so it was like when when artists would come through town i would always like i was always into you know there's a lot of live music back then a lot of dope artists coming through so i'd always have plugs on going to these shows and i'd always pull up and bless some artists with some weed just it was just a natural thing to do you know they're in your city and you got some good weed you want to kind of connect with you're kind of like a fan of the music too potentially or the artists or you just appreciate their music so you definitely want to go and like bless them so i was always kind of like it a lot of a lot of shows and stuff like that and always connecting with musicians and stuff like that. So that's kind of like another reason that kind of led up to like being in that circle of artists of just like musicians, artists, graffiti, skateboarding. Once again, it all kind of comes back to just like the culture. Like that was like what became, you know, at that time it had so much influence on everything essentially now where, you know, that's, advertise you name it now right everything is influenced by hip-hop and graffiti and skateboarding and cannabis ultimately which is one of those glues that like ties all those things and everybody together you know it's the conduit in a sense it is the conduit between yeah. cultures between religions between ages i mean no. it doesn't matter and so so yeah so like 95 is like when i started uh, a friend of uh and i we basically started to do a um to do wanted to do like a compilation like 95 96 uh wanted to do like a compilation like in the bay area there was all these like rap compilations of like you'd get a bunch of different artists from the area and like everybody would do a song and then you would put out a compilation essentially so i started working on a compilation with a friend and from there i started getting in touch with different artists like basically you know getting different artists to do songs and at the same time i had the champagne at that time which i became known for uh it was originally just the champagne and then from there it evolved into the champelli just because it was just like the street the street basically ended up like naming me champelli i just always had the champagne and it just evolved into champelli <laughs> so that was kind of like, <laughs> that was kind of like how that went and then i basically turned that into the record label it was like champelli entertainment and then from there i started you know working with a bunch of art we started with the the compilation doing that and that's kind of how i kind of like wet my feet as far as like connecting with a ton of bay area artists you know so i like for example uh you know i, I did a song with mac mall which ended up leading to doing a song with mac dre and meeting mac dre and, and getting to know him and so forth and rocking with him um and then throughout that whole process, I just kind of submerged myself deeper and deeper into the music as far as like I learned the craft also 
of being in the studio and putting in so many hours. I learned how to use an MPC. I learned how to like, you know, just basically produce and kind of like in a way for with music is like direct, you know, the artist and the song and the music and just having your hand in that with the artist. And usually it's just vibing out and natural and organic. It's not like you're like planning anything out. It's just coming organic. You guys are both smoking. Everybody's smoking weed and it just happens. It's like an organic thing. But that's kind of how I like cut my teeth in the music industry, like working with a ton of local Bay Area artists and then having my record label and like releasing uh, independent records out of the Bay Area on my record label and stuff, you know. The day that you link up with Mac Dre, what's that like? So, I mean, it's kind of crazy because he was just like getting out of jail, basically. And, you know, he pulled up to the studio in Hayward at the spot called G-Man Stands and he pulled up and he had an Impala 96, I guess it was 95 that had the Impala year too. So 95, 96, but he had an Impala with the, um, an ADAT in it, which was like what usually came out of the music studios, what you listen to your, he, so he had an ADAT recorder in his like, instead of a stereo or a tape deck or a CD he had an ADAT, which was like what comes out of like is a master out of your studio and goes into the car. So like we like, so we, yeah, that was like our first thing. We just smoked a ton of fucking, we smoked a ton of weed and vibed out and did a song with uh, Mac Dre and Mac Maul. And um, the wow. rest was history from there. Yeah. You know? Did you have like, uh, well, so you had done a, you had, you had done a song with Mac Ma. How'd you get introduced to him and how'd that all come about? So, so Mac Ma originally a good friend of mine that I'd known since like the early nineties. Um, Sess one actually, uh, just a music guy as well. And was like, always, he was like into producing. He actually like kind of put me onto the MPC 3000. I was like, before that I'd messed around with like the ASR 10 and vinyl and stuff like that. And, uh, but yeah, he put me onto the three MPC 3000 and he was friends with Mac Maul. And so that's, he brought him over to, he had a little studio at his house and um, that's where we were recording that old compilation at that time. And like, and so he brought him through there and that's how I met Mac Maul. And then you were like, yo, how do we get Mac Dre? He just got out of jail. Let's do the, you know, let's do something with Mac Dre. So we kind of did that and we just did a bunch of different artists from back then. It was like, you know, Doobie, um, Mac Maul, Mac Dre. What's funny is that like, you're just staying true to you. And like, yeah, yeah. It, like we were talking before is that cannabis, is, is it is a connector in like mm -hmm. all worlds. It really doesn't matter. And you're just like, oh, I like music, I like graffiti, I like this, yeah. I like that. And yeah. you're just Champelli. And yeah, just I, I was kind of like, just, you know, basically in a way, just the hippie kid growing weed in San Francisco. And it's like, I went to school with like so many different people and was just like, friends with everybody just such a mix of you know from samoans to blacks to asians cambodians Vietnamese, you know mexicans like i you know so it's like i was just like just like an extended you know extended community of people that i related to and so that was kind of like you know how it all went down like just like that just how was have, having all that being in the culture and just being organically doing it you know so it was like all champelli just as a brand is just like an organic movement from the from the dirt basically you know so to speak literally just Straight all the up. way up and Maybe just you know not young. contrived or nothing like it's just been what i've been living and breathing all these years has been like creating it's like what i thrive off of is just like creating whether it's music whether it's clothing whether it's making strains connecting with people and just building and just you know trying to do dope shit you know the original name champagne would that did that come from just being yo it's high end this is high end that was what? basically and it just had a champagne like quality in a way you know we thought it did when you know we named it but it's like originally it came with another name so it actually when i first got it because it's like ultimately none of none of us are creating anything so to speak you know it's like it's all you know whether you believe in the universe or God or whatever, it's all here to begin with. We might curate the plant and do some mixing and some intermingling and this and that and do some cool stuff. But it's like, we're not starting from scratch. You know what I mean? Ever yeah, <laughs> basically, you know, point. none of us are like, mm -hmm. so it's an interesting thing. So, um, yeah. So I basically got it and was just, you know, it first came to me as the Butler was the original name it came as the but been different it came as the butler yeah it came as the butler you know the what butler. i mean and then it evolved into the champagne and then 
And, uh, you know, it was just champagne, Pelly or, or, um, you know, or Champelli basically. But, um, yeah, no, it's interesting. The evolution, the evolution of it, you know, and originally I was just buying the weed, um, at the time. Cause I used to be like, basically like a really, at that time it was like huge broker basically back in the day moving like tons and tons of weed. I, I probably can't even put a number on like how many pounds of weed i moved like you know years and years ago so is uh but that was like so i was just buying tons of this weed and always had it and that's how i kind of became known for like as having the champagne and known as champelli is just like i always had this weed you know so and then from there i got bag seed out of it started the bag seed and did a breeding project got seed and then then started growing it myself also but like before the champagne and the champelli it was like i'd already also done all made a ton of other shit and had a ton of other names and other strains and all this other stuff that I'd already been doing for years too. So it wasn't like, it wasn't even, that wasn't even the Champelli wasn't even the total beginning of it. You know, mm -hmm. it was like going back to like light depping in 88 and shit, you know? So it's kind of, it's crazy what catches, wild. right? It's always like, man, they came out of nowhere. It's like, yeah, yeah. 10 years before <laughs> yeah. that, he's like pulling, taking shit down to the basement back up, like messing around, yeah. you know, coming up with other names, branding. They were on that early. Yo, what up? It's Blackleaf. I'm here at Grow Generation. And guess what? Drip Hydro storm in the market. All the best growers I know are switching to it. And guess what? There's a reason because it's preserving terps. I keep hearing that preserving terps. And that's why we're here with Sunshine, facility advisor, facility manager, overall the man with Drip Hydro. Listen to why it's different, man. What's going on, guys? Sunny here with Drip Hydro. Thing is, at the end of the day, we just wanted to make a simple, clean, cost effective nutrient line that nobody has really seen on the market right now. Nobody uses really our chelation formulas. Uh, the micronutrients that we have pulled to make this line is really just what makes it overall bringing that consistency and quality back to what we want to see in growing herb again and overall at the end of the day it's still really light on your wallet it's a five-part nutrient line and again if you're not staying sterile or you have a big facility and you don't want to run rock wool and you want to run a mix of cocoa with an enzyme or something you don't even have to run flow with it so at the end of the day it's just saving you money on your wallet while bringing the consistency and the quality of terps back we wanted to bring the terps back and bring the soul back to growing versatility cost effective and quality i mean what else can you ask for drip hydro first smoke of the day black leaf approved peace Yo, we're right here downtown la at the grow generation where the pros go to grow and if you didn't already know whether you come in store like us or you go shop online growgeneration.com use the code first smoke 10 make sure you come check it out come check out the drip hydro and everything else we appreciate you guys, and you already know, skin side. Yo, what's up, First Smoke family? Want to take a second to remind you guys, we appreciate your support for hopping on the Patreon. It's patreon.com slash FSOTD. We got brand new shows that have been hitting. They're exclusive to Patreon. You won't see them anywhere else. Make sure you get on Patreon, support the show, join the family. We got in-person events and much, much, much more. This is a real community, and we show a lot of love. And also, shout out to Dr. Dabber, we got a lot of things we're about to unveil, a lot of things we're about to roll out. Go get you an excess. That's what me and Biggs are smoking on. We're smoking that excess, Dr. Dabber excess, and use code FSOTD for 15% off, drdabber.com. We appreciate you guys. Peace. At, at the time, who else did you know that was like growing and stuff? So, you know, first off, like that time I was talking about my brother taking me up to uh mendocino county and one of his good friends which was a family friend that actually like basically knew me in europe when i was in my mom's belly so he was like one of the family friends but he was i mean he was growing like that was like in the mid 80s before i was even growing or doing anything and he's actually the one who like told me like yo you can like do use light deprivation to get weed sooner you know so yeah wow, yeah so he was kind of like he was like up, up on game i mean he's happen. also the one like also was like putting me on like you know, like blasting, blasting shake to like make wax. I was like over in Spain in 2001, like with cans of gas, like blasting, trying to get fucking make wow. wax back then. That's in crazy. 2001. Yeah. Early days. <laughs> Early days. Yeah. I was experimenting. What was it like in your twenties and stuff when you kind of, kind of got older? So it was that when you started, uh, Champelli entertainment. Yeah. That's that? when I kind of had Champelli entertainment going. That was like the mid, mid 90s and i mean i was just like at that time a lot of i mean 
I used to do like a lot of work in, in Humboldt and had a lot of good friends in Humboldt at that time. And this is at the time was like pounds were like still 5,000, 4,800 in Humboldt of like, you know, some good, you know, most of it was just grown with generators at that time, you know, but there was a time when like outdoor and indoor weed, like there was, it was almost the same price. It didn't matter if it was good weed, like it would still be 3,500 bucks or 4,000 bucks or even 5,000 difference. It, and it almost didn't matter. Like the weed was like that good too. Like you would be like, you could put them back to back. Like some of the best weed I've ever actually probably smoked and stuff has been like outdoor weed, you know? And a lot of that, you know, now it's like, because of the scale and the intent and how weed is grown outdoors now, a lot of it, not all of it, but a lot of it just is like commercial and it just doesn't have the same love or the same, you know, treatment that stuff has. So it doesn't come out that great. But I mean, I remember like two years ago, my buddy brought me this outdoor that had like smoked better than any of the indoor had smoked all year long. So it's all just about, you know, the intent with the plant and how you treat it and what the inputs are and like also genetics, of course, as well. But but yeah. You know. So what did, when did you, when did you start like breaking off to like going to humble and shit and like really launching so, the trap? I mean, career? shit. I mean, I was like, this is in, I mean, I'm trying to really think, I mean, it goes back into the early, early nineties or something, but like mid nineties, I was going hard and like taking trips to Humboldt and bringing down like four or 500 pounds, basically, you know, at a time in, to the Bay. Yeah. At like 5,000, 4,800 a pound. <laughs> What type of what? How much were you up? Like how much were you marking them up and shit? Like what were you? How I mean, was I would make a thousand dollars. I you know for me it was like I had to make a thousand to eight hundred on every pound. And you like, were bringing like, out four or five hundred at yeah, a time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> My and dog then, still got some money bearing. So <laughs> stop playing around. <laughs> but that's the thing, you know. You hear a lot of these old stories and these old guys. They all had millions, and everybody had millions. And it just goes to show, it's like when you get a dollar, you got to try to hold on to it. It's like you you know money comes and goes like there's time there's a time you know off of the streets like you know i had a few million dollars in the mid 90s you know i had like literally multiple millions in the mid 90s and then also went back down to zero and started over all over again you know i had to leave the country and um and it's one of those things like life goes in cycles and you got to be kind of be able to prepare to go with the flow with things sometimes, you know, and, and, um, sometimes it's all for a reason too, you know? So you gotta, gotta just go with the flow of it and, and be able to rebuild. The point is to be able to get back up and rebuild yourself and do it all over again. And, and also just realize that the money isn't what makes you ultimately, you know, as much as we like attach our worth and everything and we're taught is, humans or you know nowadays as people and you know, especially men just like that all our worth is just attached to money and a monetary thing you know and that's what everything is just driven towards now it's like everything is a is a sale now you know and that's just because of the way society is and the world and uh you know and i mean obviously try to imagine stuff other way another way if we were doing bartering or it was different shit like we'd have our whole, our whole other interests would be on would be totally different the world would be, would be a totally different place but you know now the reality with capitalism and so forth that it is what it is now but but point being like old you like some of your even some of your past guests they've had like millions and millions and now it's like back to square one you know and that's like the that's the thing with like the game uh, especially if you're not doing it legitimately, like you could go all the way up and have tons and tons of money and then be back down to square one. You know what I mean? So that's like part of the lesson is to just make sure you get your legit shit together and, and, you know, try to try to get shit, get shit right basically. So you can have that, have that, uh, you know, that real wealth that's going to longevity, that's going to last, you know, you'd be able to pass something on your kids or have something, you know? So I want to stick in the heyday for a little while. Yeah. It's exciting. Like, you bring it down four or 500 units, you're making thousand dollars a pound, give or take. I know things happen, whatever, yeah, yeah. but how many trips are you making? Like, how often is this? And like, how, like, you know, what's your lifestyle like at the time? Like, are you living a dope ass crib, dope car? I mean, like, I pretty much, I mean, just to like go into it, you know, I don't really talk or yeah, it's I about know. this too much, but I mean, I'm going I mean, to get into it here just because it was, you know, 25, 30 or 30 years ago. And it's like, it was a dope uh, little moment in time there, you know, but I mean, I basically had like, 
you know, four or five houses pretty much. You know, I had a house in the East Bay, a house in Humboldt, actually on the coast, um, a house in San Francisco, um, you know, so just like multiple spots, you know, a couple other small apartments and things. And, um, and I was doing trips like weekly, bi-weekly, essentially doing the hum the Humboldt thing. You know what I mean? Like that was it. It was like, I had like some really good friends up there that loved me every time I would show up. It would be like, <laughs> oh, you know, go up to Salmon Creek, go all over the place there. And they would just be, you know, overjoyed to see me back in the day. And, um, and yeah, back in the day, it was like, it was still, it was a super, the gauntlet was still the gauntlet. It was all bad. And I was probably even worse then, you know what I mean? It was like no joke, like coming down that road, you know? So, um, yeah, shit was wild. For sure. Worse than what, what, uh, what type of whip did you ever like splurge on a whip or like, So oh yeah. So I had, I mean, back in the days I had tons of cars. I had like, I was into Chevys, like classic Chevys. So I had like, you know, I had like four or five like convertible Chevelles, like SS Chevelles, like and shit like that, and a Cadillac and a Cyclone and a Grand National. And like, this is all like in the mid 90s, just had all the cars that everybody kind of wants to have now. You know? it. And that yeah. makes sense too, on the music world and all that shit starts yeah. converging because yeah. they're like, oh, that's that boy Pelly. Like, you yeah, yeah. find out. Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah, and I was like, yeah, that's wild. They start yeah. respecting you at a whole different, whole yeah. different level and all that, you know. For Man, sure, you, you like the heyday and like when. Well, the it wasn't shit was easy like, to like, you know, it's not easy coming out of a city, inner city, and growing up there too. It's like a small village in a way, and then you know, people do know you. You have to move a certain way in an inner city to like get up and stay up in a sense because it's like there's wolves out there, you know, and like to be able to like move and do your thing and survive and not like get God or take a loss or whatever. Like it takes a certain type of person in order to do that. Like, you know, back then, or even now for that matter, you know, it's like maybe even worse now <laughs> than it was then, you know what I mean? It's now it's like pretty cutthroat, you know? So it's like, but definitely to like, you know, make some serious money off the streets back then and keep it and keep doing your thing amongst like a lot of craziness going on, like endless stories of craziness for sure, like happening, you know, and be able to like kind of be the lily or the flower in the mud and try to just be untouched and stay balanced and stay being yourself and not get too like absorbed or lost or, you know, just egoed out or whatever, you know. That's a great out image. The lily in the mud, <laughs> right? When no matter the waves and all the crazy, still beautiful, shit, yeah. And still, it's its own. It's like it's yeah. a snowflake, right? It's yeah. like a little different from everything else, no matter what. You know, that's a great know. image, bro. That's cool. What so, what's uh, you know, you said that you 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 dipped out, you mm -hmm. left, and you felt heat coming on and stuff like that. Like, what's uh, what's the lead up point until that? I mean, like, even you know, bef yeah, before that, lead up point would be like after humble. Like it was an interesting transition with um actually canadian weed oh, ah yeah, so BCs, like yeah. yeah the bc started coming Ooh. down super heavy so that was like a whole nother for me for me it was like yeah it changed it because i was like i stopped going to humboldt uh as much you know i stopped going to humboldt as much and basically it was like the bc would just like come to me you know and it was like thousands and thousands of pounds like at a time basically it's like I'd buy a thousand, they'd front me a thousand type of shit. Yeah, I'd buy 500, they'd give me 500. Like it was literally like that amount of like weed. Like, and it was like a weekly thing pretty much. Yeah, and that time that shit's selling. And itself. that was like, and it brought the price down of humble weed. Like humble weed was at five, it was 48 and then it was like four. And it's like, now we're getting beasters for like four and 35. You know, when it first kind of like cut the market with the Humboldt stuff, you know, but then it like even like started cutting, getting even cheaper, obviously, you know, as time went on, but it's still like, you know, held pretty firm for a while there. And it was like, you know, the, the BC weed was like, you know, it was hit or miss. A lot of the shit would be coming like fucking wet and all fucked up and you get mold and you get shitty ass red colored strains that were just horrible. You know what I mean? Shit that you wouldn't, we'd call it like the mac and cheese. It was like this red shit that was just horrible. You know what I mean? It was mac like, yeah, it was like <laughs> fucking is horrible. And this is like in two th early 2000s. This is like shit. a little bit before 2000s, but it went, it carried over into the 2000s. <gasps> and it's kind of like, you know, when the, when the 9-11 happened, it kind of affected 
you know, it kind of affected the border. And that's like when it kind of got shut down a little more, but not totally, you know, it was still kind of running, you know what I mean? But, but I was like kind of ahead of the game as far as like the BC stuff. I was like already doing it like, and still in the like, you know, m late nineties essentially is when it kind of started, when I started to see the BC stuff and even a little bit before, but just not to the degree that I was seeing it. Like, I mean, I probably started seeing BC stuff in like mid, like 96, 97, 90. I mean, maybe even saw it and didn't know it, but wow. ultimately, you know, but, um, but yeah, the BC was like prolific. Like that shit was like, they were bringing it down. Like, yeah, it was coming down by the ton low, Honest, literally by the ton. Yeah, it was literally. all the same cut. It was all that, like, like 99% of it was that same strain. Well, they had that one, like that one strain. And then I was like, it was a training thing. Like, so I had to be like with these guys, like at least the guys that I was working on, I was like, yo, this red shit, like I can't take it anymore. Don't bring me any more of this red shit. Like that shit's got to go. So then they actually had like good other, like I'd get stuff that was like cushy, you know what I mean? And I'd get uh, this one strain that I named it the glue back in the day. It was like the original glue. And this is pre Gorilla Glue, pre anything. This was like the original glue. And it was like a hash plant, but it was like potty and just so crystally. And you could like stick it to the wall and it would just stay on the wall damn near. So we called it the glue. And like everybody loved the glue. And I like, I was like, ah, it smelled good and it was fire. It just was like looked amazing. And it was, it was good weed. It was like a hash plant and people just loved it. But it was like, I like, you know, had every, everybody in the hood like everybody was loving the glue for a while too that was like another one that was like at that time and it's like i was like kind of like turned a lot of like crack spots into weed spots basically to say that Man, it's a profit <laughs> and dope. then you get busted and it's a lot less than crack right but it's like that's dope no man. one knows the the shittiness of having to break down a bc bud into like a joint by hand and it like it's just like breaking was, a yeah. rock into other rocks. I just <laughs> yeah, remember, yeah, yeah. like <laughs> unless you've been through that and you've literally gotten BC, but you try to put it through a grinder and it's just like caking up and gone. And you're just like, yeah. that red bud stuff was just different. Yeah, like, thank it was God different. That's yeah. extinct. I like, know, uh, whatever flip that side was. Of the yeah, yeah, yeah. Flip side of that. <laughs> you know, good thing that was gone. Exactly. But it's true. You're right about that. It was like they would, you know, a lot of the times it would get compacted so much. So going back to that, it was like, I had to tell them like, yo, I want these strains. Like you guys ramp these strains up and ramp these strains down and don't pack the shit out of them to the point of like where they're looking like, you know, where it's looking like Mexican weed, basically. You know what I mean? Straight up. But, um, compressed. You peel out of, uh, yeah, full thing of red buds. Yeah. Yeah. It would just be a, br yeah, just be a brisk super. Just, it looked like a, you know, it looked like a pound would look like a QP or a half mm -hmm. pound essentially, you know, by the time of, and they would pack it when it was wet. So it would just oh, really yeah, get, fucked. it would really be just fucked. Harsh. You know what I mean? Yeah. Harsh, just burn. Like talk about burning gnarly, clumpy black, just fucked up, you know, burn. It would have oh, been amazing. still loving it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it would have yeah. been amazing to see where that was being grown back then because it like, was in such massive like farms. the saddest yeah. story i remember i went to hawaii this was in the 90s i was doing a show i threw a show out there and we went to hawaii and this hawaiian kid's like yo i got some hawaiian and he pulled out some of that bc red bud and i was like i didn't have the heart to tell him like dude that's canadian weed i was like oh my god how the fuck and it was just going everywhere you know at that time but i was like damn it was just heartbreaking to see you know he had he thought he had some pakalolo or something mm -hmm. or what i was like oh man and it was the bc red that red the mac and cheese and i was like what the hell See, he probably got sold it as like, hey, brother, we got some local for you. And yeah, he bought yeah. it. He's thinking like, hell yeah, this smells like pineapple. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, like, <laughs> yeah, no, people get fooled all the time. Oh, man. Things, so things are going good and everything. Like, how did you, how did you start catching wind that you're like, yo, I think I need, I think I'm going to dip or like, or were you taking losses where like, was, sh was shit going bad at that time? Or was it like great? And you're like, I damn, mean, I'm going to have to leave this. Shit was ultimately great. You know, I was doing my thing and, you know, uh, just doing music. I was very passionate about music and trying to put out music and really just wholeheartedly had like a stable of just different artists and was building a music studio and was really just trying to go all the way with the with the music stuff you know and we had like a little i had my little clothing stuff i was doing at the time mostly just hoodies and shirts and shit like that you know but um but yeah i mean it wasn't it really it it wasn't evident you know i mean there was i was starting to catch wind of stuff in like 99 and stuff like that but it was only when i went 
down to um i actually went down to 850 bryant which is like the like the head police station in san francisco to go pay like a traffic ticket and um one of my friends that i sold weed to his girlfriend was a lawyer and she ended up getting into the elevator with me when i was leaving going downstairs and she told me if you can leave the country right now and pack it up like basically leave she Wow, that's like yeah, God that's, yeah. That's so yeah, yes. so that was she's like, yeah, she's like, your name's going around right now in certain circles right now and in certain rooms right now. Basically, she's hearing it, you know, and she was like a a pretty high hitting lawyer, and so she's like, if you can pack all your shit up and leave right now, and then I'm like building a studio. I got all these cars and got a life that I've somewhat built, you know what I mean? And it's like of just years and years of just grinding and doing my thing there in San Francisco. Um, and then to just try to have to pack up everything and try to sell what you can and then just essentially just leave, you know, leave the country. What's going through your mind that day when you're doing, you get, I back mean, out of that, that was like shit. stressful. It was like, I mean, it wasn't like one of those things I could literally leave right away. It's like, you got to get, get a plan together, figure out what you're doing and so forth. So, but it's like, you know, it was like the hammer was getting ready to come down, so to speak, you know, and I was just really just adjacent to somebody else's issues it wasn't even my own issues i just got basically fingered in the case they were like yo this guy da, da, da. there was like a couple people like telling in the case and they kind of fingered me as like the you know scapegoat in a sense for some things just to whatever like just i was just somebody they could try to throw under the bus under the bus you know in a sense so for me it was like okay stay and find out what's going to happen and try to fight this case get get into basically being you know what's going to happen is they're gonna how that all works is they get you and then they threaten you with a ton of time and you're gonna either, either you're gonna try to roll or you're gonna do that time you know i'm the type of person that would just probably do the time you know that's just like who i am and it's like uh i would rather than stick around for all that i was like i'd rather just fucking leave the country you know and it goes back to like being like somebody who's kind of international in that sense anyway so i was like all right well i guess i gotta go <laughs> start over somewhere else basically you know so you, you start to go to like so so you get that advice do you, do, in your head you start to go through like i wonder if she's like lying to me or you know or you just know immediately like nah this is what's up and i i need to like i mean i pretty much knew immediately that that was the mm -hmm. case and then not only that somebody else had like sent a kite from jail that had already been swooped up after she had told me basically told me like yo tell pelly to you know to leave or whatever the country so i got it like twice how long or did tell it Pelly that shit's about to happen. That's like, I think all he said, he didn't say leave the country or anything. He was like in jail and sent a kite out essentially to like, let me know. How long from the time she hey, told you that in the elevator was it until you got to dip? I mean, it was basically, I'd say, uh, I mean, I don't know. I'm trying to wonder. It was like a, a couple of weeks if not a month, but I think it was almost like That's weeks, damn near. Yeah. That's quick though. I know, but I wasn't able to do everything. I just basically had to leave a lot of shit behind, hope some friends would like handle some shit for me. But you know how that goes. It's like, it's hard to like have anybody you can really count on in this shit. You know, God. people are pretty wishy-washy. It's like, you maybe have a few solid friends that are going to hold you down. And then a lot of them are just, everybody's kind of around because you got money and you got shit and it's all popping at that time, you know, and then when all that's gone, then well, like it's who's, good, it's good. who's, yeah, exactly. Who's standing when the smoke clears, so to speak, you know? So what do you, you just booked a flight and you're like, I just booked the flight. Shit I mean, there for yeah, I mean, like, yeah, oh, that fuck, was alone. Was was like, yeah, shit. exactly. Yeah. I didn't know. I wasn't sure what to expect, but I kind of ended up flying out of the country without a hitch luckily. And so that was, uh, that was good. Where'd you, where'd you head to? I ended up going to Amsterdam yeah perfect choice yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, yeah. Like, come get me over here man yeah come i ended up going some of the best weed refugees of all time have done that yeah yeah literally exactly. that move what, from sam california skunk straight, straight yeah sam yeah. the skunk man i mean oh yeah. bro on yeah and on. yeah there's a lot you go of people out there and you start thinking these guys are all dutch and you're like no i'm from california you're like wait what yeah, yeah. oh i'm from new york you're like oh okay yeah, soma they soma's from new york well over there yeah there's they a lot of expats well that have kind of gone over there and made a life for themselves. You know what I mean? And some of them, like you say, are because they're trying to either get away from something or they just want, you know, a different lifestyle. Mm -hmm. You know, at the time where it was like back in the day, it was like someplace where you could go and not be persecuted for weed too, you know? So it was like a little more freedom, you know? 
A lot more. Some of the best guys I know did that. So what was that? What was that first few months like when you're getting over there? Were you like, were you like kind of going through withdrawals of just like the lifestyle and like just just the fast pace of like being needed all the time and like having so much purpose to like and not being able to really talk or call anybody or nothing i basically had to just like cut everything and everybody off and not you know try to resist the resist trying to call people or talk or do any of that you know so it was like it really was like start starting from scratch you know but i think part of it is is like you know an exercise in life essentially is kind of like you know just that zen exercise of being able to kind of let everything go and just like realize like we we aren't you know, our possessions or we aren't all our, all this material stuff or even who we kind of like what we, you know, project to the world, even, you know, who we are in a sense, you know, so in a way it's kind of liberating, so to speak, you know, to be able to kind of like, you know, obviously it had its shitty sides too, but it's like, liber I had to find the good parts of it, which was like, all right, the liberation from, you know, having to, you know, whatever, you know, be whoever I was there and not that I was pretending anything, but it was just, just trying to be who you are, even in the world every day. It's like, you know, you're, it's, it's a, you know, it's, it's, it's a, you know, it's always has its challenges and stuff. So, but just letting everything go. So it was definitely an effort in like letting material stuff go, letting like what my, you know, in throughout life, we always like try to like, you know, our stories like become us, like what, what our attachments are, what our things are, what our accolades are, or what our things we've done, you know, and to be able to kind of stand alone as a man and still be secure with yourself as a person and even come back to the United States with like, you know, like kind of no money or not the same stature, so to speak, like, you know, and start all over again and still try to garner success and garner respect um from scratch you know what i mean it has you know it's a, it's an interesting pr it's all very humbling so to speak you know to go through all that and then um and also like you know be able to like still like what you built everything on in, in a way that foundation deep down still stands because if like if you're a solid person and you've built with solid people and treated people well and good in the long run i've always been about like doing good business and like you know treating people good and and uh, and stuff like that and that's kind of like what ultimately pays off because especially in cannabis like a lot of it is your circle is what keeps you afloat and your community and stuff like that that's like kind of like what you know ultimately how everybody in a way survives in in a sense in cannabis too you know it's like a community in a way you know 100 percent. you it, you are your surroundings especially mm -hmm. with your connection right it's like your net worth is your network especially in cannabis what, yeah. what what was that like first first year like for you like when did you start being able to like settle in and like did you know people over there already a little bit and had some connections or so i mean i had a couple friends uh over there actually one of my good friends that I ended up connecting with over there was actually my boy, um, Rick Delisi, Richard Delisi's, um, son lived over there. So he was a good friend that I ended up connecting with when I touched down in Amsterdam and he helped me out a lot. You know, I stayed with him for a bit and just was good, good people. You know what I mean? And then, uh, Rick senior was what doing life in prison. Yeah. Rick, R Richard Delisi, Rick senior was doing life in prison and, you know, and it's, it's a trip because, uh, Rick and I had always kind of like plotted on like, oh, how could we get him out of jail? We got to get your dad out of jail. And there was this sense of urgency. And I saw how much like pain and dismay he was going through of having his dad in jail, you know, for weed and just like what it was doing to him and his family and stuff like that. And we we're always like kind of trying to figure out, like, I remember you get calls from jail and stuff like that. And we'd always try to figure out like, how do we get him out of jail, you know? And so it all kind of came full circle and we were able to kind of like help, you know, push it in the right direction to kind of get him released like two years ago. So he finally came home and to be able to be there for the reunion and see them get back together and stuff as a family was pretty dope. You know, I think he's like one of the last guys that was doing life in prison for cannabis yeah. for like a nonviolent cannabis offense. Mm -hmm. Crazy, yeah, bro. Pretty crazy. Yeah. That's crazy how you intertwine with all this too. And like a, a very humble, just you know, non look at me type way. Like you were just, you were there for so many different things, so many mm -hmm. different phases of cannabis. Like it's, it's, it's surreal. Well, when you got over there and stuff like, 
were you good on money or were you thinking like, damn, I gotta, I gotta, like, what am I gonna do with my time? Well, like, you know, of course, as you know, chance has it, when I kind of left the United States, I wasn't really at my highest point, you know, that I was. I like invested in, like, back then it was like it cost a lot of money to make music. So I was like spending, you know, a ton of money on like just doing albums and doing music and stuff like that and built a studio, I had a ton of cars, you know, doing. St- not stupid shit, but just more, for, you know, like you figure the, the money's going to keep coming because you're not going anywhere, leaving the country. So you're just doing your thing. But uh, so I kind of left at a lower point. I had some bread, you know what I mean? But I wasn't like bawling out of control to where I was like, oh, I'm Gucci. Fuck it. Whatever. You know what I mean? So, yeah, it was like a little more of a challenge when I got over to Europe to try to like figure shit out again and like and essentially start from scratch over there you know and that's like so it was a trip but you know i kind of ended up getting back to you know also once again just pointing back to the plant how much cannabis has given me just throughout my life and stuff like that through connection of through the plant is just to community and people and stuff like that and you know i um found a way to kind of make make ends meet over there in Europe, just, you know, through the plant. Once again, I tried a ton of different other stuff. And I, at the time I was producing music. So I was like, you know, um, trying to work with artists and stuff like that. And a lot of big artists would come through Europe and I would try to be networking with them and getting them do production for them and get them beats and stuff like that. But, um, it's hard from a distance being, you know, in Europe and trying to, trying to follow up in the United States, you know, you kind of got to be there in the studio a lot of the times to make these things happen, you know, but, um, definitely it's, it's, it's a challenge, you know, um, how long do you live in Amsterdam? Well, I lived there for like about a year or so, and then kind of would come back and forth, you know? So I, I'd, uh, ballsy. Yeah. I'd come back and forth, not to the United States, but just within Europe. So like I went down, I had some friends that were growing in Switzerland. So I ended up going down to Switzerland. There was a time in Switzerland, I'd say like around 2002, 2003, where it was like basically kind of quasi legal. And it was like Switzerland was like fields of weed everywhere in Southern Switzerland. So it was just like weed everywhere. So I went down there and was doing some growing and helping out some friends and networking down there. And like, it was a like a really pretty cool, like international like weed scene of just like growers from all over the world, all just there like growing like fields and fields of weed, like 25,000 plants, like just shit like that. Like it was like ridiculous amount of weed. And um, there was kind of like a loophole to sell it there as like a medicinal pillow and shit. It was like different (laughs) little things. And then people were obviously uh, smuggling it and taking it, you know, um, to Italy and Germany and other France and stuff like that from there. Yeah, it was crazy you mentioned that because we were in Amsterdam, mm-hmm. Amsterdam, what, a year or two ago, and one of the homies was showing us all these greenhouses that are just full of hemp, and they're waiting on legislation and shit to hit, and they're just going to switch right over wow, to yeah. THC, yeah, yeah. and it was just like, I mean, a beautiful facility, yeah. and they were like as far as you could see, and you're like, Switzerland? Yeah. yeah. It yeah. just doesn't seem like the place but i get you know it's yeah right switzerland there, so you know like, when you get down to like the southern kind of most province like ticino it's like the italian side of switzerland there's like switzerland has like you know a german side a french side an italian side where it's kind of like touching all these borders and the italian side is where they kind of were doing the most growing and like was tolerated the most it was a lot more conservative in like the german and the french kind of area parts you know provinces or whatever but in the italian side is like where it was popping it was like full-on like just like weed fest like and all these people were coming like all this kind of like european trim immigrants were coming from all over and like trimming like huge trim parties and it was it was quite it was really pretty a dope time in cannabis for sure that's it was really experience. dope. Man, you saw like so many different facets <laughs> yeah. of the yeah. game. Like it's pretty crazy. And you're like, so moving into that, like, did you, how long did you stay in Amsterdam? So, I mean, I stayed, you know, I was kind of bouncing back and forth between Amsterdam, Switzerland and Spain and like a little bit of Italy, you know? So that's kind of like my main thing and being born in Spain, 
Um, I spent a lot of time there, you know, also. Was your dad still there? My dad still lived there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I have my own that's place a, and everything, but that, that, that was that, great. Yeah, yeah, that was great. It, just because I hadn't had a chance to spend like a lot of time with them over the years, you know, since I kind of grew up mostly with my mom. So, you know, I mean, he'd started a new family and stuff, but it was still cool to, you know, be able to kind of catch up with pops and stuff, you know, and see him a little bit more, just have him closer, closer by, you know? Did he know that you had had to leave or? Yeah. I mean, I basically had to tell him the story, you know, and he was, you know, pretty worried about the whole thing, basically, you know, obviously. Like, Cause it's like, I don't know, you know, at that point I really didn't know what I was leaving was for it, yeah. or what the charges were or like anything. And it's like, you know, you don't know how serious, whether it's like inner pools coming for you or what, you know, you don't know. So, I mean, it's a there terrible was, way to live. Yeah, it was it was pretty rough, honestly. Yeah, it was like just like living out of a bag forever, basically. <laughs> so when when it goes like maybe year one or I'm, I'm not sure how long, but like as time's going by and it seems seeming further further out, are you hearing anything? Is anyone hitting you up? Is anyone telling you like, oh man, come back, you're tripping? Or yeah, so I mean, I'd hired a lawyer and tried to look into it, but in the end of the day, he really couldn't even give me any info. You know, he didn't. You know, because it's just one of those things with the with the federal case. It's like you know, they're not really telling you shit, basically. So, I mean, later come to find out, I did have a warrant for my arrest, a federal warrant for my arrest, and the charges were conspiracy to distribute cannabis. So, if he wow. would have stayed, it would have been a problem. Yeah. Yep. Well, and then also what the problem really would have been when they really needed me to like, because I was adjacent, basically, the person that I was dealing with was like the main king kingpin in the case because it was like a rico case so he was like the main guy so i just undoubtedly feel like they would have probably tried to have me roll on him or something you know what i Are mean it would have been clear. obvious and it wouldn't have been like the six months that i got once it was all over and everybody had been charged it would have been like you're looking at 15 20 years like you're looking and they would have cooked up and made a ton of other charges because that's just like what they do but next thing you know you're doing 15 years because you yeah. don't talk on somebody yeah on a weed case that's a conspiracy they never even get you with anything they yeah, just get you i with never got caught with these anything. other people say that you were involved it's like yeah yeah what so Crazy. that's uh yeah so that's where that was that's you know so yeah it was it was worrisome <laughs> wondering what was gonna happen yeah, it's like days are long yeah when you have that on your mind for sure um what's uh how long was it before you, you know, so, how long were you abroad so i mean i actually stayed in europe until about 2005 and then like my passport was running out so i ended up going to mexico because down in mexico like europe it's hard to wiggle around without a passport mm -hmm. whereas like mexico you could wiggle around without a passport if you needed to you know damn so i made side. sure to I made sure to make enough bread and then leave Europe, go to Mexico, and then stayed there for like another four years, basically, before I tried to come back to the United States. So how many, what is that, like three or four years you stayed in Europe? Yeah, I stayed in Europe for, I got there in 2001, so I stayed there for about like almost four years, probably. What's some of the memories and like some of the things that you ran into over there that you're just like, maybe... You're like, man, I got to get out of here. Or like, man, I, like you're you're glad to be there. Or like, what's what's your mind frame at that point? I mean, honestly, it was like overall pretty good experiences, you know, aside from like maybe not like being, you know, like flush with paper. But as far as like just like living, like I did some like really good memories of just like living, you know, because I mean, the United States, it's like <clears throat> when I was in the United States and just grinding, it's like you know, it becomes just a blur. It's just like the same, every day is kind of the same thing in a way, you know, and you get into these, we get into these routines where you can just keep going and doing the same shit over and over again. It's the same thing, you know, and unless you switch it up, it's like, all right, well, I just 15 years just flew by, uh, you know, just grinding and it all seems like the same thing. And I was like living in San Francisco, it's like, where I was living, it's like the foggy part of the city. It's like, every, it's just foggy all the time. You don't even know if it's summertime or anything. And it's just like days just fly by. You're like, oh shit, there goes, you know, 10 years just flew by. You don't even know, you know what I mean? It's just like life can fly by with the routine or whatever. So it was good to get out of that and just like be living somewhere else and break up the routine and appreciate life. And, you know, like I was always say is like, I'd rather be, you know, living 
on a beach or in the mountains, like eating fucking having to forage than like do a day in jail if I can avoid it type of shit. You know what I mean? So that like, is the your thought, freedom, huh? your freedom is so important, you know, ultimately and life itself. So like, you know, so bringing it into Mexico, when you just get there, what do you think? And what's it, what's going through your mind? And then what's crazy too, is that like your dad did went to Mexico and your brother was already in Mexico. So there was that kind of your thought of like, well, they were there. Like, I'll just, if they do it out, you know, I, I, I could live there too. Yeah. I mean, you know, honestly, so it's like, uh, you know, I mean, basically my, you know, I never really said this, but my brother, he, my brother who passed away, rest in peace. He, um, had left the United States like 20 years earlier too. And actually basically it left, went on the run too. <laughs> and it left and lived outside of the United States for like 30 something years. Holy yeah. shit. Back so he never out. came back. He never came back. He couldn't come back. Yeah. No, was, couldn't. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't come Could back. Could you speak yeah. on that? Like, what was it? I just mean, like it was just, it was, you know, it was like kind of the, at that point, it was like kind of the, you know, it was just the heyday of fucking the eighties, basically of, you know, it was just drug related, you know, they would have now no violence or anything like that, but just drugs. Yeah. It would have come back. It would have been like all bad, you know? Wow. You know? So you already seen these examples like kind of play out and stuff. So in your head, it couldn't have seemed like that crazy. Cause I feel like for most people, they can never leave like that. Try to grasp doing or something like for that. Yeah. Six months and come right back. Yeah. Yeah. Or go to another state or something, right? Think you're good. Yeah. Yeah. Or it's they like say, you can't like, really I'll leave if this ever happens. But for a lot of people to say, well, okay, that chapter's closed and let's move on now. Yeah, yeah. That's a tough one for a lot of people. It's like, my, well, I got my mom and my, it's like, yeah, yeah, you got to drop yeah. most of that. Most people don't even leave their hometown their whole life. No, I know. I know. It's true. Most people, I'd yeah. say 70%. Yeah, at more. least, like, at least. This, this, this guy, guy you over know, the whole world. <laughs> yeah. But it's like, that's, that was normal to him almost. And say, that's what I'm gathering yeah. is that like, that's like the way you were raised almost. Is yeah. that like, look, you could be here, there, wherever. It's all about, where, what you are here and yeah, like that's yeah. the feeling i get off you when i interact and we talk and stuff yeah, is yeah. that like you've you've managed to be present during these times and like get the most out of it which i feel like is like the biggest key to life and it's like one of the hardest things to do it is you're right about that yeah so everybody's like you know we have certain levels of, at of attachment to stuff and things like that and it's hard for people to let go you know what i mean and stuff and i mean in life nothing everything nothing's really permanent so to speak you know so you kind of got to be able to be able to just be prepared for you know for that changes change is inevitable you know it's always going to be some kind of change you know so when you touch down in Mexico, are you thinking like, damn, I need to learn some Spanish or like, you know, what are you thinking? Like, well, you know, next phase of the adventure, or did you have some contacts there? Yeah. So, I mean, I, uh, you know, I have family there basically also. So, um, and I, I speak Spanish fluently. So then that oh, was man. like clutch, you know? So that was like a big, you already in there. Yeah. So I was already in there, but yeah, Mexico was dope. I honestly, I had a, I had a great time in Mexico. I mean, both Europe and Mexico was like, it was like living a whole nother life essentially, you know? And, um, you know, a really kind of like, I was I was happy after just kind of doing the same thing for a while. It's almost like I think everybody should do some sort of like midlife sort of like just go live somewhere else a little bit. You know what I mean? Even though it's kind of tough coming back and like starting and there's something to be said about like being in the same spot long enough to build whatever it is you're trying to build too, you know? So it's like my approach now is like I'm very focused on just like building my brand and just like staying put and just like working on that, you know? And um and it's, it's something I'm passionate about. And so that's, I'm just like focused on that, but definitely like, you know, uh, there's something to be said about like, you know, just making sure to break it up and enjoy life and go do some different shit though, for sure. At the same time, you know, of all the places you were living, who has the best food? Damn. That's a good, that's a good question right there. You know, um, I mean, damn, I'd have to say, I mean, if I could, you know, I'd say, uh, Let's see. I mean, San Francisco has a diversity. If I'm going to say San Francisco, it has like all these different cultures and so much different stuff, obviously. But, uh, and then Mexico, Mexican food is like fire. I can pretty much eat that almost every day. <laughs> and then Spanish food is like a bit of an acquired taste, but when you really get down to it, it's like Mediterranean diet. It's like probably the, the best shit ever, you know, like, uh, 
you know, I had like a bunch of friends that I'd gone to school with over there in Spain because I did go to Spain when I was in elementary school. I did one year in Spain in elementary school over there. Um, that didn't end up counting as a year when I got back to the United States, but I kind of had all these friends from that year in school over there in this little village in Spain. And they all had like farms and like, you know, goats and vegetables and olives and grapes and making wine. So when I was over there, we were like, it was like, you know, it was like a cooking show. Basically it was just like making our own wine, making our own cheeses. And like, I barely eat meat, but it would be like every now and then they'd make some, you know, some jam jamón serrano, which is like the cured pork or this and that. And then like, just like cooking over open fire and just like, it's like what they, what you would say peasant food, you know what I mean? They're like growing it all there and everything, but it's like you come to like a Michelin star restaurant and it's like what they're serving there at the Michelin star restaurant, what you would consider like peasant food, you know, but it was just like super fire and like some of the best eating for sure. And then you got the Mediterranean there. So you got mad, like really good fish and everything. So that's like, it's pretty, pretty sweet spot for eating. Ultimately you can, you can do some good eating over there for sure. When you when you're in Mexico, what region are you in? I was down in Jalisco. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that's the. And what's the day to day life in living in Mexico at this time? And what are we in? Are we in the like two? This is in. This uh, point? Yeah, no. This is at this point we are in like yeah late two thousands. You know, at this point from mid to late two thousands. And I mean, you know, day to day in Mexico is is great. Also, that's like another spot where it's like. I was probably in the best shape of my life because I was swimming like, like this whole bay where I was at. I was like swim like three miles a day and like be working out, wake up, go work out, swim three miles, go back, get some breakfast and some coconuts, do some reading in the hammock, do some music, take a little siesta, go back out, swim again, and then go out at night and get food. And like, I mean, it was really honestly <laughs> like very super, like honestly, like high quality of life ultimately live consider a longer like live that. a lot longer mm -hmm. considering like you know like what life is like here where it's like everybody at this point we all got anxiety we all stressed out we're running around like you know none of this shit's good for any of us like right now like and i feel like the life expectancy is going to go down considering like the how we're all living and when you I look agree. at like you know my pops he's still alive and he's like 92 or something but he spent most of his time like living up in the mountains in Spain, you know what I mean? So there yeah. you go. Like that says it all. There. Yeah. He's just chilling and, and doing what he loves, which was his art. So he followed his passion and his art. So it's like finding what you love and your passion and following that. And then trying to like, you know, you got to make a living. And I mean, he went through like, a, he finally had success as an artist, but he was like, you know, you know, starving artist for most of his life, but he did just stuck to what he loved. You know what I mean? The whole time. And then, I mean, you know, they even have studies showing that like, you know, little bits of famine or starvation can like still be good for your health too, right? Intermittent fasting or whatever, oh, or, you know what I mean? Do fast a few days every now and then, but, um, but yeah, no, and he, you know, lived in the mountains and still like in his nineties basically. So I guess it's something. It definitely is. Yeah. You know, like something and, to I that mean, life. I, you compare that to like a life of a billionaire who's miserable. Yeah. I mean, it's a trip because I've seen so many people with tons of money. And I mean, even when I had like a lot, a lot, you know, a decent amount of money, like in the nineties and early two thousands, there it was like, I wasn't really ultimate time. Yeah. I was like having 3 million or whatever it was, three point something. It was like off of the streets. It was like a lot of money, you know, for that's like, well, yeah. that's probably like, 15 20 million now yeah, probably like so, from the nine like maybe a little more so pretty but crazy it's like i wasn't happy though you know what i mean and I you really were happier wasn't, when you were so out. i was happy when i i was happy when i had damn near nothing you know what i mean like i was just like i just felt happier it was just more of a relief and whatever and, you know you had worries like oh how are you gonna get by but somehow the universe does seem to provide and you do end up getting by somehow like in life, you know, if you're open to it and you're on the right path and you're not like, you know, obviously like drugged out or something like the universe, you know, if you kind of do will the right thing, you're going to find some way. Yeah. You end up yeah. finding some way to get through, you know, that's an invaluable lesson he learned though. Yeah. That most people either learn later in life or learn through i'd never, never learn yeah. and, but he learned that at an early age it was almost forced upon him but now looking back it's like it, it's funny it's like a blessing like yeah. he got so much culture 
the amount of like, I can just tell too, with your stories, like wherever you go, you have a circle of friends Mm -hmm. within a certain amount of time. It's like, oh, we were in Spain making cheese and like some people would have been hiding out for a year. Yeah. You know, like it's not, you go to, you go to Amsterdam and I already know you're in the mix over there. Like Mm -hmm. I already know, you know, it's, it's, it just says a lot about your character too. And like how you build relationships with people around you like mm-hmm. it's why you're champelli for sure for sure you know so everyone yeah. knows champagne champelli like mm-hmm. like coming into year two year three of mexico and you know you got good quality of life and stuff what starts coming in your mind to where you're like you know i think i'm gonna flex back soon and just see what's up well part of it is my my own just like drive and i, I guess like you know you want to kind of like achieve certain things in life and some of that is like once again comes maybe maybe down to ego and stuff but also you're like you know i'm still young and want to like still want to contribute and do you know do stuff that i, I want to achieve you know what i mean i still had aspirations you know to do my music stuff still passionate about music so i want to produce and work with like-minded artists and um you know have success in that field of uh you know music and and just art and creativity and just being able to you know be with like minds and and when i was down there i started doing music with local artists and creating and doing videos and connecting with more musicians and stuff so i was starting to build that community there too um but you know that's part of it is it's it's like kind of like tied to financial slash you know like uh, trying to achieve some stuff in life that you kind of want to achieve so that was kind of like part of it's like when i flew back i was like flying back to la to try to like take some meetings on some music stuff and production and stuff like that you know so it was kind of a were you keeping in touch with anybody while you were gone? i mean at that point like a few years into it i started to reach back out and keep in touch with like a few a few people you weren't worried about like uh, i mean at that point i was over there yeah i was like you know i was kind of like it is what it is essentially you know i mean i'm still a little worrisome but i mean i was just you know so you come back to la were you worried about being were they waiting on you or something yeah so i'd actually believe it or not i came back a year before i'd actually walked across the border in tijuana and went up to like yosemite area and actually did like a whole grow up there with a couple friends and, and like you got grew. through no problem yeah i walked right through no problem and went and grew made some bread left and and like just drove back down you drove back through i drove back down but then coming back up i was like well, that was kind of a mission like dr- you know having to get up there you know in mexico and so forth like driving back up and all that stuff i was like i oh, just fucking seemed like i went through and everything was like went without a hitch but like when i flew into la it was just like red flags and they swooped me up you know they fucking pull you to secondary uh, and shit. yeah yeah they're like, all right, point, like we all go. right yeah exactly. now i'm gonna find out what's been going on or it, well essentially then it'll tell you shit but yeah you know you kind of know that it's some shit at that point you know when they basically take you you know, hand you over to the feds and they take you and put you down here and like the holding thing down here in LA for like, you know, the, the fed shit basically. So it was all bad. I was like, at that point I was like, uh, How'd something you feel was up. That? Were you a little bit relieved? I mean, or? not really because it's like, you don't know still. Yeah, no, I mean, at the, I mean, I know it's, it's related to that, but it's just bullshit because it's like, this is almost 10 years later. I thought the statute of limitations had already surpassed, but it's like federal is 10 years and not, you know less so i was i came back a little early you know what i Damn, mean so you just missed yeah i was like, like eight and a half or nine almost two, and i, shit, I didn't know that drove, you know bro. i know yeah. i know i should have just drove too for all you people at home you should just drive <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> don't, exactly don't give them the advice well, you yeah. know yeah yeah make sure you drive oh uh, um, yeah yeah <laughs> and walk yeah um, bro that's wow so, so you're getting nabbed up. Did were you did you have that on your mind on the trip or were you like, nah, I'm gonna be I good. mean, I thought about it. Obviously, flying up was definitely a worry, you know, like, all right, I'm flying in, you know, flying is gonna be different than driving. So I was like, oh shit, you know. So And times was, had caught up now. Obviously, nine eleven, all these things had already happened now. So like the board the coming in and out of places is much different. Yeah, much different. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, it was like, you know, in, in LA is like the state of the art, like, you know, as far as like filtering through people from other countries coming in like they're gonna just like whatever you got or anything it's all gonna come up right there and they're gonna see it you know they're like mr champagne good <laughs> yeah, to see yeah. you again well they're <laughs> actually joking like oh the weeds joking with me about weed stuff and like you know like really? you know, so they're like wow. had me in the car taking me over there oh so what's the strains of this and that and you know they're like you know and like 
Yeah, I was just like crazy. You know, I'm just like I don't know. <laughs> I'm still like I don't know. <laughs> what was the worst part about that? I mean, you know, it's just. I mean, what would I say the worst part? I mean, just your freedom, essentially, just knowing, you know, you can, you're you kind of stuck in there. You're powerless in a sense. You know, they take away, you know, you're just at these people's, you know, mercy in a sense, you know, and you know they don't have your best interest in mind. They don't really give a shit about you. You're just another number in there. And it's like all your humanity is taken away and everything is like, you know, stripped down. Um and, you know, I had to also within that, I also had to like go super Zen and basically try to find like the good within that too, you know, and like try to meditate and read and exercise and try to not be like, cause if you try to, if you get like, you know, people go crazy in there, just like thinking about getting out and this, uh, this and that, like you can, you can drive yourself crazy just like in there. If you don't just become, find a way to become at peace with it and like make the most of the time. So I kind of like, you have to kind of be able to go inward on it and like, and honestly, I did have some like pretty Zen moments in there where I was like, I was able to kind of let go of everything once again and just be like at peace in a sense, even though it like sucked, but you know, and I could barely eat any of the food because I'm pretty much like a pescatarian slash vegetarian. So I was like, you know, every night I'd be trading everybody my meat stuff for like a little shitty little piece of lettuce or an orange or whatever and like some grits or whatever. But it was like pretty bleak as far as the food goes, you know? Fuck Damn. Him. So yeah. Yeah, you're coming up on your release date. What's going through your mind? I mean, shit, I'm coming up on my release date is like, damn, all right, well, I'm going to get, I mean, it was like, basically they want, they want me to have like three years of, uh, three years of probation when I get out essentially is what was like kind of, um, negotiated. So I like have to stay in the area. I can't fucking obviously have anything to do with cannabis. I have to like call and check in. And I mean, it's just kind of a hindrance because it's like I get out. I probably would have, you know, I was in the Bay Area. I probably would have gone to L.A. or done something else or just like kind of got to move around as a man to make a living. But they just like stifle you and you got to stay here in this area. You got to call. You know, if you do want to go somewhere, you have to like ask for permission and like two weeks in advance. And well, the most fucked part of that was like my my brother had passed away in Mexico. And I wasn't able to go to his funeral. Um, they wouldn't grant me like, because it was like two last minute, they wouldn't grant me like, um, you know, permission to go to his funeral, which was like pretty fucked, honestly. So I was like. That's fucking tough. Yeah, right yeah. There. Yeah. So you had three years paper when you got out and you had to yeah. deal with that. What'd you do for like a job and all that shit? I mean, I basically, uh, I, let's see. I mean, I kind of did a lot of shit. I was like, for a while I worked as like a, at a bar, I was like a bar back and like doing security a little bit. And then also went on to the, like, uh, whatever, some painting. Like I was kind of taking odd jobs. It wasn't exactly easy to get work and figure shit out. Like, you know, you're limited as to what you can do to try to find housing. And they're on you. Like, with no where money. Are you yeah. You where you this? Yeah. You job. got everything got to check out. So it's like, you know, you got to, where are you getting your money from? Where all this and that? And it's like, I basically ended up uh, getting into this restaurant and working at a restaurant as like a chef basically for a while. So, and it's like, I'm passionate about food and I love cooking. So it's like food is like a, a big, you know, part of my life. So, um, you know, I, I already knew a ton of cooking stuff, but I learned some technical stuff there and it was like, it was cool. It was cool. So that was like a, a good experience, you know, or something. I mean, it's hard ass work working in a restaurant. is like, no joke. That's just like a lot of hard work to be honest. Yeah, I don't think people realize like how like those people work hard as hell every yeah, day. Yeah, and I mean, I had like there's these guys like the people in there that I was working around like, you know, it was like uh like these cats from Oaxaca and they like could do circles around me. It's like one of them could like run the whole kitchen like by himself pretty much. It's like so fast. I'm over here chopping some shit. Like he's like done <laughs> chopping like 10 onions versus my one onion type. You know what I mean? Like they're just like just like no those guys are like serious like no joke like as far as when it comes to like holding shit down they're like got a lot of respect for them when you got back and you're on paper and shit what are you thinking about the weed scene and stuff like you've seen all this stuff how, how far it's came and like it's kind of like opening so, up i mean at this time this is like when i kind of first connected with burner too it was like back then and watching him like print his first t-shirts in my buddy's garage and i go over there and was kind of like helping out and shit like that you know not maybe his first it was like a second run 
of t-shirts and stuff like that. And, you know, watching kind of like what he's doing. And before I come back, he'd already been on YouTube and kind of doing some of that stuff, you know? So I was like, I kind of saw that and just saw stuff going on, you know? And, um, and obviously I was trying to figure out ways to kind of get, how would I get back into it? And, and having the limitations of being on probation, like made it, you know, like hindered me. Not trying you know. to go back where you just yeah were. exactly so I had it I just had to just basically be cool for three years when I got back you know what I mean essentially till like 2013 ish you know which is still heyday time yeah so 2014 I basically head for the hills and start to go grow which makes sense the yeah. time yeah you're like. Were you worried at that point up in the hills like if shit went south like I mean fuck, it, man I don't want to like that because I mean. Bro, you just took us through 10 years of like <laughs> shit where most people would have buckled yeah. for, for real, you know? And then like the end of it is like, thank God you did. Cause like you said, you wouldn't have known how would it, you know, you could have, we could have not been having this conversation yeah. today, literally, yeah. which is crazy. Yeah. I mean, well, part of me is like, I got to kind of like, I have a certain amount of drive that I have to, you know, for myself and stuff. It's like, you know, um, you know, I've I've always been doing this weed shit forever. It's all I know, essentially, to to a degree. Cool. You know, obviously, in, 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 in that time that I was on probation and even during the time that I was growing, um, I was cultivating, like, all my creative side as far as directing videos. I was directing a bunch of music videos, producing music, honing my photography skills, like, all these different tools that later on would serve me for my brand and, like, having a better understanding and also more hands-on as far as, like, when it comes to creating and stuff like that, you know? So, so that downtime, I try to use it for the to, like, basically cultivate, you know, some positive creative things that i was passionate about at the same time you know aside from the working stuff like once i was kind of like like when i definitely went heavier into that like after i'd grown for a couple of years and i had the leisure a little more leisure to be able to like cultivate the creative stuff you know it's like directing music videos and working with artists again and stuff like that you know what part of the hills did you head up to i ended up going to grass valley yeah, you know, I ended up yeah. going to Grass Valley and growing up there. I had like mixed light, uh, full term, light dab. I kind of had like it all going at the same time. It was like the first year I did it, I like I bit off more than I could chew probably, you know, trying to run it myself. And then I had to like bring on a couple people. But second year, I'd got like a bunch more people to help me. But uh, um, even then, it's like, you know, now you're dealing with like HR, like just resource human management like dealing with humans and people and just like you know uh you know basically trying to you know be a boss essentially as far as like working and telling people what to do and it like creates more work ultimately for yourself you like still got to do everything and you got to like you think having all these people is going to make your life easier but you ultimately still have to do everything yourself almost you know so that was a challenge but it was, it was great it was interesting that was like my first year i did I had grown this. I like focused on just like, you know, kind of monocropping, so to speak of one thing I do like, uh, um, Oh, I did Larry lemon OG, which is basically like a good OG essentially, you know? And then the second year I did, which was 2015, I did cookies and I did, uh, some sherb and like gelat, like sherbet at that point. Yeah. Did you ever know any of the guys like Sherbinsky, Jiga, any of these guys like growing up and shit? Did you guys ever brush shoulders or anything or was it different? So it's kind of like a, di a little bit of a different time. Like, uh, like Jai was in the city around my time and we didn't really, we knew kind of of each other, you know, we had like kind of parallel, some mutual friends and stuff like that. So like somebody like him, um, Sherbinsky was like a little bit younger than me, not a lot younger. And like, I think it was like, you know, probably up in Sacramento at that time, I think. And then, um, you know, like I knew Powers and Powers, his brother, he honestly powers like dates back, like to like when I was doing my shit, like I knew Powers, like, and he's a city cat. So we like know each other in the weed game like that. And like rest in peace, his brother shock. Like, uh, we were good friends and always had connected on the weed stuff, you know? And shout out to Uncle Powers, man. 
Right. Yeah, so Powers was, you know, Powers had been doing it. Um, Did you know Tone back then? Straight Flame at all? So Tone kind of like came from, I mean, he was around at that time and he was actually, he was like a few degrees away from me through other friends. And he was like, he would get, sh- he would get the champagne and stuff through my one boy. And like, yeah, it was like, t- he was like a few degrees away, but we never got like a chance to really hang at that time, you know? He talks but, highly of it. Yeah, He's, no, he yeah. He brings it up. He brought up in our podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah no. Tone's the man. That's yeah. a that's a solid dude. It's so that's somebody who's super passionate and you know got love for the plant and is really doing it out here. You know, on the for the love of the plant. You know, and been been around it forever. You know, is really just like a weed guy. You know, and there's like you know, I mean, there's always there's you know just like you know with this whole new wave of people and everything coming in you have people that are just like really love the weed and are really in it and then you have just people getting in it just kind of like you know just so fuel lifestyle. different yeah just like you know different different intentions and stuff like that you know so you're up in the hills and stuff when do you, when do you start feeling like you know what i need to drop i need to well, i need to yeah, I start to see like 2017. I'm starting to see more brands and more stuff. I like, I go out and go to like, I don't know if I went to a ham con or I went to something like, and I was like, you know what? Like, I never, every, other people were like, you should bring it back, this and that. Like, Burn at one point wanted to do like an interview with me. And then I was like, you know what? I was just like too sketched out to even talk about my story still. I was just still like very, you know, in the cuts just because of the nature of, you know, the game yeah. and shit. And so, um but i was like you know what fuck it i'm gonna bring back the brand you know so to speak so that's why i started working and really starting to focus on the on the brand you know what i mean and that was like first kind of like through music like doing music videos with art and making music producing music for artists that i was gonna like release on you know uh, on the brand on my label it's just kind of a lifestyle so there's the component of music clothing and cannabis which it's kind of always been and um so that was kind of like you know one of my um one of the uh one of the mediums that i was expressing myself through was the music and stuff and then um i also have like actual champagne seeds from back in the day so like kind of managed to like have those tucked away the whole time pretty much you know and like a whole other gang of old seeds as well so i like got like a really like unique unique library of old school stuff you know still which is pretty cool that's fucking legendary so you oh, actually mm. got to bring it back yeah like, so actually. i have i haven't even cracked them yet i haven't even oh, brought wow. it back yeah yeah so i've and a lot of that just stems from like just wanting to have like a space that i really have control of and everything right. where i'm like you know fully saw but i mean meanwhile i've been doing like these last couple of years i've been doing a ton of breeding projects i got like a few different people that i'm working with as far as breeding goes just because it's like i had to come to the realization i can't do everything by myself so i'm like you know finding good people and it's taken ye- a few years to just like gel with people and build that trust and those relationships even with cultivations you know where you want to be like um you feel comfortable like working with people you know what i mean and knowing that they're going to say what they're going to do and so forth and you know and i mean you know i mean sometimes relationships even after a few years can go bad like that but for the most part the people that i've kind of circled i've got right now is like really good people and it's been working out pretty good you know and that brings us to like the 50 flavors on the yeah the table and like yeah. what you've been doing like even you know the last couple months if not years yeah you know. hunting down new stuff like let's talk about some of this new stuff yeah no i mean i mean my aim is obviously to have like a proprietary menu where it's like i could almost call everything that i have my own you know so to speak um you know once again right now i've been you know basing stuff on existing things mostly um and starting to bring out some of my old seed stock and starting to introduce some of these older things you know into some of the newer stuff you know um but yeah so the goal is to have my own proprietary menu that's unique and that's like coming together you know finally and part of it was like you know as a breeder as a cultivator as somebody that's passionate about weed like and people have a certain expectation um of from me of that of me having a certain level of quality and unique smoke too so it's like i'm not i'm not going to just i can't come out and my whole line is just stuff that exists you know what i mean i might have one or two things that i've like hunted 
or really picked or curated or whatever that maybe is like, oh, it's a lemon cherry, but it's the most candy, is sickest cut, you know, that we've found that, you know, that we're going to have on the menu there. But most of it, like I'm proud to say, out of like the five different SKUs that we just dropped last year at the end of the year, the end of the quarter there, <clears throat> we first, we just dropped in the rec market for the first time. Um, I could say that four out of four of those things, all of them are unique profiles, like different than just that I have one candy lemon cherry just to have it because you kind of need it as a staple and it's a fire ass one that burns white that's solid you know the exclusivo mm -hmm. so and I mean I do I do like that you know what I mean mm -hmm. and um respect to everybody that put in the work to for that strain to get where it is today you know and it's requires a lot of hands and a lot of people a lot of times it's not just one person you know um but yeah I'm just all about like creating the new menu and bringing that out and and over this next year just I'm scaling up a ton of these things and obviously having to hunt them and get things all dialed in. And then basically, I mean, I've got like so many different new breeding projects coming and I just finished like two other breeding projects with like, so I got a ton of new seeds. I got like this really exciting one I'm doing. I got like a lot of shit in the works to where it's like genetics isn't going to be an issue. And then I'm like finding like a lot of keepers and things I'm super stoked on already. Like I'm like, shit, I'm excited about a lot of the things like, I mean, this initially out of these like 20 things was originally like 125 different things. Wow. All different crosses too. And Holy so you whittled shit. it down, whittled it down, whittled <laughs> yeah. it down to where you're like, all right, these are the ones that are worth another look or could represent my brand or exactly. I like smoking obviously too. Yeah, exactly. So that's kind of like where it's at right now, you know? And I mean, as we talked earlier about like, I kind of want to have a rotating menu part of the market and the dynamic of it now is it's always moving and changing and you got to keep people's interests and stuff like that. And just as humans, you want to swear, you don't want to eat the same food every night is the same way. You don't want to smoke the same weed maybe every night. Although like there's times when like the champagne was around, like all I wanted to smoke was champagne or all I wanted to smoke was OG. And those are like certain smokes you could smoke every day. And it's like, yeah. it's like a, a well-rounded thing. You know what I mean? so certain smoke if it's good enough it could be a staple so i ultimately want to like also have some staples that don't change or go away and stay pure so to speak you know what i mean like having certain things that you know um that just kind of stay on the menu also so keep a few of those and then have some few rotating things you know and then when i bring back some of these old strains i ultimately want to keep some of them uh just pure and un unadulterated you know and keep make sure that we maintain that because a lot of stuff starts to get watered down and you lose the original you know so you want to kind of keep that keep some original and uh, and also do crosses and stuff but um looking to uh kind of get a seed line going i already got a bunch of like seed stuff going on i'm just doing some more hunting and gonna get ready to do some more breeding from that but we'll you know hope and have a seed line up and like going by the end of the year realistically probably because i mean all this stuff takes so much time to get together you know i'm excited to smoke a few of those on off the mic afterwards the, yeah. the thing we do after this yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, man yeah. i'm looking forward to talking about a few of them and lighting a few of those up yeah. congrats on the rec drop too by the way Dude, man you know, no yeah speedable. thank you thank you no that was what a, a hell of a journey to get to that yeah I so mean, fucking a i mean it definitely was kind of like the mythological joseph campbell journey as far as like <laughs> slay the dragon try to capture the princess and like Holy reinstate shit. myself because i'm like, on, like you know, level 20 bro yeah yeah, yeah i'm trying to yeah. like it's like a full mission so like part of me now is like i'm really like on some like you know i mean and it's kind of written so i'm just kind of having to see it through and say it's kind of the turtle's pace but i'm like basically on my way to just taking my brand to the top where I want it to be, where I envision I should be as a, as a person and, you know, as a pioneer. Get to, yeah. And get, you know, try to get it to where I, I believe I should be with the brand and everything else. And I'm just kind of, you know, don't want to say humbly doing it, but that's what I'm doing. Just kind of just, you know, chipping away and doing it and just, you know, not asking for any handouts and trying to do it independently. And I mean, I've had conversations with some of like the biggest, you know, corporations and conglomerates and even MSOs in the game. And I'm, I'm like, always come back to just doing it myself pretty much, you know, for now, at least, although yeah. like, I'm still open to the right partner that gets it. And that really brings what I would need to the table. And that doesn't always necessarily mean money. It means more than that. A lot of the times, you know what I mean? You got to have the other, you got to have like the, all the other elements 
in play. And it's, it's difficult because I have a high standard for the brand and what my expectations are and stuff. And people might have some of the elements that I want, but not others. And I mean, it's never like, it doesn't ever seem like it'd be the perfect situation. So I'm like having to compile different elements from different places in order to kind of get what I need to work. You know, as far as like these cultivators are growing good, I'm getting like white ash and nice rosin, great taste. And like the smoke I'm looking for, for example, and you know, just, putting it all together, independent distro, and just kind of piecing it all together um, in order to make it work for now, you know? Any collabs coming up? I mean, I definitely got some collabs coming up. I mean, you know, Sherbinsky and I have been talking about, you know, doing something for a while, right. you know, uh, Dubs Garden and La Cause, um, you know, my folks, you know, there's a, there's a bunch of different people that, keeping you know, bay, we've been talking about strong. Yeah. Yeah. I got to keep, yeah. Just keeping, you know, keeping the bay stuff going. And I mean, there's a, a couple like little on tuck little artists I've been talking to that are kind of, you know, some bigger things that I was going to maybe try to do potential little artist collabs and stuff like that. And, um, yeah, you know, I got, I got some, I got some stuff in the works for sure for this year. going to try to get it out there. Man, you got a hell of a story. Lived a hell of a life. Feels like about six, seven lifetimes. <laughs> yeah, real. right. It does. Straight like. up. Yeah, even from a kid, you lived a hell of a life. Yeah, not yeah. a lot of people, not a lot of kids, I think, no. were, you know, taking well, international trips on airplanes yeah. and stuff, getting sent to the other parent or whatnot. Yeah, I feel, I feel bad about kids nowadays in a way. A lot of them just, you know, just kind of like, you know, and as a kid, I used iPad. to, used to, yeah, parked on an iPad. And I mean, I used to be playing in the streets till it was dark and running around up and, you know, stealing fruit out of trees and playing football and running around doing, you know, shit or whatever, you know, I mean, around growing weed. Yeah. Running around growing shit. weed. I mean, another one of my memories, tagging up trains, and yeah, tagging trains and shit. muni buses. And yeah, no, it's pretty wild. One other story that I just thought of, like, yeah, it was like, uh, me and my mom were like, drove up from Mexico. We were driving up from Mexico when I was a kid, uh, before I was growing or obviously I was like a little kid essentially, but we uh, were driving with a family friend driving this RV up and um, basically my mom, like we get to the border and they're like having a conversation and my mom's like, we're, well, we're going to get out and walk across. So we end up getting, was loaded. <laughs> we get out and walk across the border and then our friend I ends up going to jail and doing time. So we got out right now. Wow. Holy yeah, shit. Yeah. That yeah. bitch is loaded down. Huh? Yeah, loaded down. Well, you were yeah. born into this shit. Man. <laughs> yeah. This shit yeah. chose you. Yeah. You are the chosen one. <laughs> Dude, uh, OG pretty support OG. you right here with the chosen one. His name's <laughs> Champelli. <laughs> I got one question for you, though, as we phase out. Yeah. Do you know who brought the haze to New York? <laughs> yeah. So who brought the haze who to New York? Him, Good. I, yeah. The good. people are going crazy. About that's who good. Brought that's it. good question right there. Who brought the haze to New York? You well, would be a guy that I would think might. Yeah, know, yeah. I mean, know. I have a couple. I have a couple uh, different theories on it. You know what I mean? Who brought the haze to New York originally? But a lot of it is like honestly, was some of that original haze that was making it to New York was actually coming from Canada. It was BC, huh? It's coming from Canada. I remember because, BC Hayes. Because, oh, wow. I feel like that's when really? we got that in Florida. Because. Yeah, for uh, sure. You I mean, know, we got it was lied different. to and got told it was grown it was local. Because it was different. Yeah. Some of it was actually coming from there. And I mean, you know, New York isn't far from Amsterdam. So a lot of seeds would make it over there. People would grow it upstate and different stuff like that. But a lot of a lot of Canadian weed would come through Buffalo and whatever and Detroit and, you know, through Michigan or wherever the, how the borders touch right there. And like, it would make it over to the East coast, you know? Shit, man. We'll get into the rest of it off that's the mic a, after this. Yeah, yeah. That's a don't whole get other story. Don't get on don't, don't come with Champelli, man. No, I'm about to me about it. Fill up this Dr. Dabber with a fat dab too. Sheesh. Oh, oh man. shit, man! Any shout outs? Anything while we close out? Man, it's been well, a hell you know, of a day. I, we, I'm just happy we I got mean, to kick yeah, it no, today, it's a bro. Lot, like, I know it was last minute, but man, I'm glad we finally got it in. You know what I mean? Super pleasure. I'm, I'm, I'm just honored you guys had had me on the on the man, podcast and and, and um, open up your story and your life like this. Yeah. Yeah, it means a lot, bro. Uh, for well, real. Thank you. Yeah, no, for sure, man. Definitely. I mean, um, yeah. I mean, I just say keep a lookout for all the different flavors that we got coming out this year. You know, whether it's the Ropium, the Super Gremlin, the Cassis, the Exclusivo, the Modiano, and then also just uh, 
check out champelli.co. I got a ton of different clothing dropping up there. You know, we got all types of different drip up there. So definitely check out the clothing, you know? So that's a big, that's a big thing. I, I'm, I'm all, I'm super passionate about being hands-on with the clothing design and stuff. And, you know, doing, got, a, got a lot of different cut and sew pieces and stuff and cool things that we're doing, you know? You know, I got to get a, a tech jacket or something. Yeah, right? yeah, I got to get to, yeah. I got to get to come the up to the bay. Uh, well, I got, you know, actually my fulfillment's down here in LA, so oh, we can try to, yeah, you know. Well, shit, man, yeah, support man. this man. If yeah. you're at home, support this man. Go to champelli.co and buy some of the gear. Post up, man. man. I mean, this is this is a real-ass individual that's a true pioneer in the game, in my opinion, and one of the first and, and, and is going down as one of the greats, definitely. Man, well, Hands thank down, you, man. Bro. Thank if you, guys. If you're a badass grower and you think that you can grow the fire, I mean, dude, show this dude some flour. Give this dude yeah, some flour because maybe you end up getting a pep, some seeds from way back to hunt down. Who knows what could open up the door for what? If you're a fire grower out there, put some fire in Champelli's hands. Like you never know. That's right, man. I definitely need. I'm looking for definitely good, good cultivators. That's what it's kind of coming down to right now. People that are just like worthy of the task of like growing some shit to it's like utmost what it needs to be, you know. And I got like no shortage of different new genetics and strains right now. So it's definitely a, a perfect time for that, for sure. Well, when we talk about tastemakers and curators, like you're at the top of the top, man, for yeah, real. Like yeah. you're someone that I initially right away think of is like, you know, you do it and and people view it as like, that's that's mm -hmm. dope, you know, and it catches on. So props Damn. to you, man, and props to your journey. And uh, there's still a lot left to unfold. So <laughs> let's keep writing this book. Bro. Yeah, for sure, man. Thank you guys so yeah, much I for love. everything, man. Much know. love. Episode 85 is Champelli. Episode 85. First smoke of the day. Let's go. Let's get into this box. On yeah, our there bike. it is. Peace. Yo, welcome to the Diamond Mine. The DiamondMine.LA, California source for boutique genetics. Powered by yours truly, Blackleaf. And you know what that means? That means I'm bringing my best genetics into this. I'm bringing stuff I've been hiding, harboring away, stuff I haven't wanted to let out. We're bringing all that into the diamondmine.la and we're gonna offer that to California. Go on our website, hit the newsletter, and see if you can rock with us. Get on board with some of our genetics and change your garden. The diamondmine.la, powered by Blackleaf.